the barricades at this point and has been for uh, at least 10 or 15 years, if not more. Okay, I'm happy to be happy. John? No comments? I'm fine, I'm fine with it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just real quick, it, it appears it, it'll be significantly smaller than the surrounding lots. Is that right? Or? It, it's, it's about a half an acre, roughly, and uh, there, the lot that will re be the remainder of the lot will be a little over an acre. Uh, there are uh, three <coughs> lots, fairly close proximity, they're all less than an acre. And there are other lots that are that are larger. So, uh, just so I got it, the proposed lot is, is labeled 28 Alpha on our plan. Is that correct? 28 Alpha. 28. And it'll have access off the road, the access road. Off the parkway road. Oh, okay. Are there any plans right now, or you just? It's, it's, it's just kind of been orphaned up there for a long time, so. And it required us to, you know, to get the DEP approval for the subdivision and then to come here. So, it's, you know, it's something that takes a little bit of time. Right. It makes sense to do it now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Spray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Down here, Nick. No questions. Yeah. No questions. Okay. okay. Uh, with those responses uh, and the overview that we've gotten here, I don't think I have anything else either. Um, sounds like no critical need for a required easement. So, uh, with that, I will uh, put a motion forward to move to approve the amended subdivision plan of Patrick McBrady, represented by James Gus McBrady, for the lot split of property located at 28 Parkway Drive, identified on the Scarborough tax maps, R78, lot 74. Second. Second, any discussion? All in favor. Thank you. Item number six. Augusta Housing Sketch Plan Review for Southgate House at 577 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U34, Lot 37. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's see, as some board members may recall, um, we uh, recently conducted a uh, joint hearing with the council on this item as the applicant is seeking to redevelop the Southgate House property, as you just referenced in the title, um, with 50 affordable housing units. Uh, the scope of the project um, requires contract zone uh, approval because some of the elements, including uh, overall density, um, among some other uh, elements required, don't meet the uh, underlying zoning uh, provisions. And so they're seeking, uh, <coughs> seeking council uh, consideration of that. Uh, during the workshop, um, there's the council gave a favorable opinion to keep the application going. Um, so the next step in the process is for the applicant to come before the board for a preliminary site plan and subdivision review. The applicant has chosen at this time to submit a sketch plan review, so we're still at sort of the informal review process, if you will. Um, a good opportunity for the application board to sort of just talk about uh, the general parameters of the, of the application and particularly for the board to, or the applicant to identify areas that they have concern in the design and for the board to do likewise. So moving forward, the applicant can uh, have a good understanding of uh, what their materials should focus on. Um, that provided a host of comments, and I'll just touch on a few. Um, this property uh, is identified in the town's recently adopted list of historic properties. Um, so we have zoning provisions that try to incentivize or encourage the, um, the redevelopment and preservation of historic buildings. Uh, to that end, uh, applicants can seek to utilize residential density credits, uh, provided the planning board finds that development pattern um, is designed that, to preserve the historical character of the site. So uh, probably worth discussing if the board is comfortable with the direction things are headed so far. Um, 
staff just identified a few other items, you know, that should really merit uh, particular attention through the review process as this goes forward. Access in, in and out of Route 1 has certainly got to be an area of interest, particularly left-hand turn, um, coming in from uh, northbound Route 1 traffic. Uh, the applicant, uh, the TVC 3 uh, zone does allow for a modest amount of parking to be in front of a building. The applicant is seeking uh, some parking out front, and so I think you know, there's certainly Again, merit some discussion if the board is generally comfortable with the with the direction that they're headed in, in that regard. Um, I guess the final item I'll just touch on for now is, and I know the applicants had ongoing discussions, but the fire department uh, is seeking additional fire lanes or a better understanding of uh, fire lanes throughout the site. And again, I know this is an issue that the applicants have been working with our fire department on. Um, but it would be helpful probably for the board to understand sort of the, the basis of those issues and, and what's being identified. So uh, with that, I thank that to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. Uh, and again, uh, we have seen some of this material, at least conceptually, in the form of the, the package that was put together for the joint meeting with the council. And that was a pretty comprehensive package. Um, so uh, we're maybe a little bit, some of us a little bit further along looking at this we might otherwise be in the sketch plan, but otherwise we're still kind of at a preliminary stage here. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome the applicant. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. My name is Dan Riley. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics. Uh, we're the uh, surveyor engineer at Manscaped Park Place for the project. And we're here on behalf of Vesta Housing. Um, with us tonight, Kyle Ambler, who's the project manager for Vesta, is here, as well as Rick Duty, the project architect. Um, I, as you noted in your application, we did provide a copy of the uh, application that was reviewed by the council and the uh, planning board a few weeks ago for the initial contract zone hearing. Um, the project, and we wanted to get into it a little more detail or a little discussion of some more of the site-specific items that we didn't address in detail with the council. Our, our meeting a few weeks ago was more around some of the uh, space and bulk requirements of the, of the lot and some of the uh, items in the contract zone that we'd be seeking as we get through the process. Um, the project is located at uh, 577 U.S. Route 1. It's on map 30, uh, excuse me, tax map 34, lot 37, and it's the, the, uh, the, the Southgate House property. It's about three acres with frontage, uh, about 200 feet of frontage on Route 1, uh, just north of Payne Road. The, um, it is the site, the predominant feature on the site really is the, the Southgate House, which is uh, in, in some of the graphics that are in the application. And on, on our board here is the house that fronts along Route 1, constructed in the early 1800s, uh, along with its extension to the east, to the <coughs> excuse me, to the north, at the rear of the house, and two barns um, that we'll be discussing a little bit in our proposal are the, the primary features of the site. Um, the concept plan that the best to propose is, is to construct a new building uh, with 42 affordable housing units. And that building would be constructed to the rear uh, and adjacent to and stepping behind uh, two of the historic barns on the property. Uh, in addition, the Southgate House itself currently um, houses seven apartment units. That will be converted into eight affordable housing units for that building for a total project of 50 units. Um, the property is going to break down right now with uh, eight efficiency units, 29 one-bedroom units, and five two-bedroom units for a total of 50. So as part of the development program, Avesta and part of their interest in the project is the preservation of the, of the house. Uh, part of the financing package of the project will include some uh, tax credit financing for historic preservation. And as we talk a little bit about the space and bulk requirements and, and the contract zoning, um, it has to do with the historic preservation credit that the town provides. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the proposal intends to renovate and reuse, like, as I said, the, the existing farmhouse with its extension to the rear and to renovate and, and potentially reuse on a new foundation the first barn behind the house. The second barn here, um, which is attached by a, a 20th century stairway uh, construction between the, the existing barn and what's called the carriage barn, um, will be the subject of some discussion. Uh, the intention in the application that we submitted is that the, the, the best of plans to preserve that structure, uh, but not necessarily reuse it. It's in very bad condition. Um, and it's really the amount of work that have to go into that, that structure to make it usable um, is, is uh, be 
beyond what the project can really afford and will still remain within the affordable housing guidelines. The, um, and also fire access on that side of the building is something that we, we have talked about before. Um, with the building design itself, um, I'll pull some graphics up. The <coughs> building The building is proposed uh, with a barn-shaped form to, to mimic some of the existing development patterns on the site. This elevation, looking from Route 1 or from what we're calling the south elevation um, from Route 1, uh, is a view of the building uh, and, and the existing barn behind the farmhouse. The east elevation uh, is shown above that. The proposed building will be three stories from grade at the, at the south elevation fronting on US Route 1 um, and remaining with a consistent ridge height to the rear. As the site drops down in elevation into some areas approaching Phillips Brook, which forms the rear of the property, an additional, the, the applicant seeking to create an additional fourth story down below grade, um, maintaining the same ridge height. Um, the total building will include, four, as I said, 42 units uh, in the new building, along with eight in the existing buildings. The property um, is located in the TBC3 zone. Um, the, uh, the use is an allowed use, multifamily residential housing. There are limits in the current zoning for 12 units for a new building and part of the contract zone is seeking a larger number of units in the existing building. The other, one of the other constraints are, or that plays into the design of the site, in addition to the location of the existing house and the need to sort of preserve that as the focus point uh, when, when viewed from Route 1, is the shoreland zone that extends 250 feet from Phillips Brook, which forms the rear of the property. Within that zone, uh, we've designed the site to stay, uh, to keep the impervious area within the shoreland zone portion of the site below 20% as required by the shoreland zone or ordinance. So that constraint of needing to maintain the existing structure here and here, um, along with restrictions on what kind of development can happen as the land slopes further to the rear of the property, really drives some of the site design. The other main aspect of the building program is the parking. Um, today on the site, there's existing gravel parking along the side of the building here with kind of a gravel track that passes between the barn and heads back down to Route 1. In the proposed design, um, we're proposing to maintain parking on the side of the building, extending back um, to approach the new structure and overlap a portion of the east elevation. The amount of parking we're proposing at the rear of the site is limited both because of the terrain that drops away and because of the restrictions of the shoreline zone. I don't want to disturb more than that than we need to. Um, so as, as Jay presented, the TBC3 zone does have design guidance related to the parking layout. It does allow for a row of parking in front of the building uh, when buildings are set back from the property line. Um, we've elected not to do that uh, in this approach because we, don't, we think visually that would uh, impact the historic nature of the site. So we are proposing parking along the side of the building with spaces forward of the, the building line but outside the front setback. So that's one of the parking, the parking issues that Jay alluded to. The site will be served by um, existing sewer and water utilities in US Route 1 um, as well as uh, existing power utilities that, that located the site. The driveway entrance for the, for the parking alongside the building will reuse the existing uh, driveway that, that's being used today for the property, for the departments that are there today and, and in the past when it's been used as an inn or a restaurant. Um, we have provided in the application um, some uh, graphics of what the building will look like and, and uh, Rick the architect is here uh, to discuss that building. Um, one of the important features of the, of the building is the the desire to visually or reduce the, the visual impact of that building when viewed from the street and from the abutting property. This is a perspective view sort of looking from the north uh, west from Route 1 um, showing the, the side of the, the north or west side of the uh, existing farmhouse, the barn that's going to be preserved and reused as part of the project, the building program behind the site, and a scale perspective of, of the building with, with its roof form. We've, um, in, in the layout of that building, for both reasons, for the, the uh, reasons of trying to minimize the pervious area in the, in the shoreland zone, as well as the, the, uh, the visual uh, uh, impact on the site by, excuse me, the visual impact of the building to reduce its visibility from the street, from the abutting property line, 
the footprint of the building does um, does step back away from the parking lot and down in elevation uh, as you approach the rear, sort of mimicking the, the pattern of the existing bar on, this, on the site and the pattern that's typical of this um, kind of era of construction for, for farm uh, developments throughout, uh, throughout the area. Um, with that, I guess I would, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have on the application. Um, you know, we are in a sketch plan process at this point. Um, to address the one question that, that Jay brought up regarding the fire access, we have met with the fire department. Um, we've talked about the access, access to the site from the parking lot to the, to the west side of the building and to the front of the building, and they were satisfied with that. They have asked us to look for additional fire access to the east side of the building. Um, we, it was suggested that we talk to the abutter uh, about potentially providing an easement so that the, so the access could be provided further down the side of the site and still preserving the second barn, the carriage barn on the property. Um, it doesn't look like that land is going to be available for us to do that. So in the final site plan application, it's likely or possible that this, the second barn at the rear of the site, the one that's in much worse condition um, and it's going to be, wasn't really planned to be um, reused in any way, uh, may have to be removed in order to provide that fire access. And if that becomes necessary, um, the walkways that are being shown, that are shown in orange here that are proposed to connect to the sidewalks along Group 1 would likely be widened to a wider width to allow for uh, fire apparatus to, to access the site and would be extended back to the property probably about to this location um, where the building steps down in elevation. Um, we've had some discussion, we met with the fire department to look at a number of different options for the, um, the fire access. It is Avesta's intent to um, to preserve that barn if it's feasible. Um, and part of the applications to the, to the Federal Park Service that looks at the historic properties and the tax credits that will be applied um, for the housing projects. Um, right now it does not include the preservation of that building, but we are seeking to do that um, if, if, if it's at all possible. Uh, but right now with the, with the fire access and the limitations that are presented by the, the uh, Shoreland Zone, is making that look a little bit less feasible than it was when we met with the council a few weeks ago. Um, so with that, I, I guess I would leave it and uh, answer any questions that you might have um, to address with the All right. Thank you. Susan, would you like to start off? Okay. Um, <clears throat> just so I'm sure I understand the various buildings that are there now, I, I drove in and around the building and the Southgate House itself the part that goes towards the rear of the, build, of the property is, is attached and now being used? That's correct. Yeah. It is now actually in use. Okay. Yeah, the, building, right. the building that is next to it, labeled barn, doesn't really look much like, it looks more like a shed, like a really big shed, but we're calling, I mean, was it used as a barn? I'm just curious. Yes, my understanding is that that, that building It was actually used <laughs> as a barn. Okay. Now, the only question I have is the one that we were talking about the concern with the fire department and so on, the other barn. It's not feasible to actually rehabilitate it. So I would be concerned about safety. In other words, it would not, it, it's almost like if it can't be brought back to what would be a really safe use for that building, then I would be more open to knowing more about its actual value historically and the possibility of indeed taking it down. It doesn't seem safe to me to, to leave it not rehabilitated with a lot, a lot of people running around, especially when we're going to make, we're going to have it more densely used than it is now. So that's, I'm not sure how that would work out, but it's a concern I have. And I'm just curious about the parking. And staff will have to help me with this. It seems to me that in times past, we have done parking in environments that would be um, imper not impervious, pervious surfaces. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that works, but we've done it before. I, uh, is this something that might work here? I mean, I'm thinking about, no, go ahead. Yeah, n no, um, in that, in the shoreland zone, porous pavement, even grass pavers, the DEP considers those as part of coverage. So the shoreland zone, area limits coverage to 20% of the lot area. So by not paving it, we're not gaining anything. So even if you paved it with porous pavement, if you use grass pavers, mm -hmm. DEP would that's still say that's, that's what I needed to that's know. That's 
that's covered. Okay. Um, then on the so other side of the building where there is still question about the um, fire department coming in or not, again, there's, I can't think of the name right now, but there's this very nice hotel on Route 1 just before Scarborough Downs. Comforting. Comforting. Yes. And they have access to the rear mm -hmm. with, again, not a driveway. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that works. But it would seem to me that this would be a perfect place to try to figure out how to do that because the space required to get the, the um, fire trucks in is one thing, but the actual creation of more road than we need, I mean, it's really just free and unimpeded access that we probably need. Yeah, the fire department indicated that they, they were, they would be comfortable, they were certainly comfortable with the access to two sides of the building, the front and this side. Mm -hmm. uh, what they wanted to, us to look at was uh, additional access to about this location. This little stub here would be a, a retaining wall, because yep. that's where the building steps down and grade, and, and that's where the site starts to drop off. So we're looking to provide some sort of access for the fire hours to about that point. Coming in from Route 1, or coming, I mean, where would they get to it? In this, in that scenario, they would have to come in from Route One. They'd have to use the, a, a wider sidewalk, and they were pretty flexible with what the material could be for that and the width. Um, you know, typically the ordinance requires a 20-foot width. They thought we could reduce down to 12 or 14. Okay, for that's, that. That's yeah. what I'm looking for at this point. At the sketch level, I'm just thinking that I would like to see as much of that done as possible, so it doesn't look like it's being surrounded by roads. You know, yeah, you know, it would be there for an emergency, but it wouldn't look like a road. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see that we're planning on somehow or another saving that incredible glass porch. Yes. Um, the uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> is look, actually looking at whether the building is more significant with the porch or without it. The, uh, uh -huh. the original 1805 construction that was added sometime later, either right. in the in the 1800s or early 1900s. But I'd be interested in how that goes, and hopefully no decision will be made until it comes back here, because it is that kind of stuff that makes the historic building so interesting. I think that my own personal opinion is that the house is just that much more beautiful with that torch, but I know, certainly do know that it was not originally built with that on there. So it's a very interesting topic to, right. to look at. So I'm looking forward to your um, uh, coming back and talking to us about that. I'm very excited about this. This is exactly what we were hoping was going to happen. Yay. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Roger? <laughs> Thank you. Um, will you explain uh, why you, you may not consider putting any parking in the, you know, in front of the building between the building and Route 1? I, I think it has something to do with the historical concept of, of what you have to deal with. Y yeah. Well, in a sense, the, I, I guess the, the simplest way to say it is that when the, when the Park Service reviews this and because of the <coughs> funding and the tax credits are you know, I guess the, uh, I may be misspeaking here, but the, the idea is not to diminish the, the most significant structure on the site, which is really the building. And um, we just simply sought to maintain that lawn area in front rather than installing a rope parking across the front of the building. Um, it also has to do with the position of the building. That, you know, the, the site right now, the house sits sort of in, in the center of the site, kind of at the highest point of the ground, it's kind of on a pedestal and very visible to the street. And so the idea was from the most visible angles is to not diminish the, 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 the view of that building um, from what it is today to the extent that we can. Uh, the reason I asked you is because I know uh, there's a concern about the parking in the one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. and you're going to be coming back with information about the, your other properties to assure us that that's going to work out for you. And I just thought... Uh, the public might want to, want to know why that wasn't being considered, you know, yeah. uh, parking in the front. Um, I, uh, I, I, I really think this is a great opportunity myself as well. Um, I'm not as hung up on the, on the porch as Sue is. Hung uh, up? <laughs> maybe you like Excuse the porch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's all I have. Thanks. I love the porch. Nick? Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. I do have a couple questions. Um, and I think, as my colleague alluded to, parking is, is definitely one of my concerns here with the one-to-one -one ratio. And um, would definitely be interested to see the information you may have on um, your other properties um, showing. Because if you had overflow, where does overflow go? Um, would be a major question. So if somebody was having visitors, where do those visitors park? 
So that, that extra information will be helpful going forward. Um, and then I have a question. The number of units you're proposing, how critical is that number to the project going forward? If it's, if it's down to 40, is this a no-go? I, I want to know why 50, and, and if that is a must-have. Sure. So I, I can speak to, to that. Um, hi, my name is Kyle Langford. Um, so with the particular different layers of financing, the primary financing source for this project will be main housing, long-term housing tax credits. Um, we need to hit a target per unit total development cost. And to really kind of diminish the impact of the, the acquisition, the initial acquisition cost, and kind of increase the scale. We need to increase the scale to kind of reduce that total development cost that we're trying to hit. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess going back to my question, is there a minimum threshold where this is a no-go? I would say 50 is certainly the target. So any request out of this board for you to reduce it to 48 units would would affect the. I think we would we would certainly consider it. But I think that's what yeah I think that's what I'm curious, especially as it relates to parking. You know if if the information comes to us and we find one to one is kind of pushing the thresholds. Well, if you had 48 units and 50 spaces, or if there's another way to get two more spaces, you know, in a 48 to 52 ratio, I become more comfortable with parking. So this kind of leads into my next question, which is. How close is the park, the first parking spot, to the uh, entry to Route One? Uh, we've got to draw it at, at 25 feet. Okay. That's it. it's tough to tell on. on yeah, the we, we, it more or less meets the maps about where the existing gravel is today. If you drive up through there, it's more or less there. It might be slightly closer, but we designed that so that we would stay out of the 25 foot setback from the minimum 25 foot setback in the zone, uh, but we needed to be in that setback between the 25 and the 75 that are required. Um, it might be worth noting um, regarding the parking. The ordinance requirement essentially is that it's one parking space for every one bedroom or efficiency unit and two parking spaces for a two bedroom unit. And so this project has five two bedroom units on it. So um, that's where the additional five parking spaces. If this project were, if we, if we reduced and eliminate, reduce those two bedroom units to one bedroom units, we would meet the parking requirement. Um, I expect that when we come forward with the final site plan, we will probably be looking at 53 spaces compared to the 50 that are on there today. Um, that's about the amount of impervious square footage that we have to work with um, within the restriction in the shoreline zone. So I think we're working on the final, you know, the final layout, some of these details now. But I think you'll probably see three more parking spaces uh, here to get us to about 53 when the final site plan comes together. Um, when we submitted this material, we were still working on building concepts and, and wanted to kind of show where we were. You know, understanding that as we refine that design, it got down to that number. There is a little bit of leeway. Uh, the, the building footprint itself has been reduced somewhat uh, from, where, from the original concepts, and that's freed up some space to do that. So I'm hoping that we at least get to that point. So the difference between 50 and 55 really is um, just because the ordinance requires two spaces for two bedroom units. Um, Avesta is looking into some, they don't have the statistics all compiled for their population and, and certainly don't keep statistics on a lot of. Um, the disabilities that the, the population that lives in these developments typically has. Um, so it's somewhat anecdotal right now in terms of, uh, you know, the population that lives in, in the best of the project tends to drive less than the general population uh, in Scarborough County. Um, so we are looking at that, um, uh, and we're going to try to come forward with the best information we can. Uh, uh, but that's really what we're talking about here is, that, you know, a, a change in the number of uh, unit configuration could get us to the to, to meet the, the standard or uh, that and it may be a combination with uh, a, a few additional spaces that we may be able to work within the zoning limits. Uh, we'll go forward with that. Thank you. And, um, you know, we have Route 1, and I, I was glad to hear 25 feet. My concern, in the, the direction I was going was with 50 mile an hour traffic coming this way, a, a turn in to this housing unit um, quickly you know, could be anticipated and I would hate to see somebody backing out of that first spot and, and take a take a fast car in the rear end. So um just glad to hear you have some separation there. I I am interested in seeing your traffic study when it's available, um, what that what kind of impact that will have. 
Um, I agree with Susan that uh, that second barn, um, if, it, if it's not going to be rehabilitated with your initial project, I would have serious concerns <coughs> about its condition going forward because I, I, I highly suspect that there would be any further funds coming in to either save it or do something else with it. So basically you, you do end up with a safety hazard perhaps. So um, I, I think you should give that some consideration that if it can't be saved or rehabilitated that perhaps it's, it's worth removing at this point based on the information you guys can provide. And then uh, I believe that is all I have here. Um, good luck. Thanks, Mike. Uh, before I go down to this other end of the table, I just want to piggyback on the, the exchange about the unit count and the per unit costs. Um, I've had a lot of first-hand experience in my day job with tax credit development programs. So I know from that experience that when you're competing for these tax credits and they are competitively awarded, there's a lot of pressure to keep your per unit costs down. and the sort of cutoff or threshold varies from round to round depending on who you're competing against and what the housing agency sets as their benchmark. So it's, I can understand that it might be difficult for the applicant to say, you know, this is our you know, line in the sand where we can't go any lower, but I do appreciate that line of questioning because it does get to the sort of the threshold feasibility in terms of the unit count and the parking. Um, but it, is, it's a, it can be a tricky development type because you're getting kind of pressure from all, all sides. So um, with that, I'll, I'll sort of reserve the rest of my comments or questions and head down here. And uh, Ron, yeah. you got anything? First of all, you mentioned the park service. What's their involvement in this? I mean, why are they the controlling entity? Uh, they have. They're involved in the determination of whether a project uh, gets on the list of National Historic, the National Historic Registry, falls under the Park Service, and their review of this in the for the federal tax credits, they're the review agency for the funding agency that would provide those tax credits. Okay, I find that interesting. I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, one other thing, based on what is the intent of the traffic flow, uh, to pick up on what Mr. McGee coming this way. Is it going to be both ways? In other words, they can be coming and taking a left-hand turn on, on Route 1? Uh, yeah, right now we're, we're still completing our traffic study. Um, we've collected counts at all, this, all the, the uh, integrated signal system through Dunstan Corner. We collected counts. We had to do it actually early this week because of the uh, uh, Memorial Day holiday. We, you know, the town's traffic is here just didn't want us to count that week. So we're looking at all the, the, the traffic on Route 1 based on actual counts and all the, the coordinated signal system up and down through there. The, the traffic pattern right now, unless the traffic study tells us otherwise, would be to allow left and right turns in and out of the project at that entrance. Uh, that could change depending on the results of the study, but that's the intent right now. Having traveled that road quite often, I, I, I just have a concern. I'm not saying it's over the top, but I have concern of taking a left-hand turn. Yeah, because those cars are going more than 50 miles an hour, right. usually, whether legally or illegally, and to have somebody stop and take that turn on the left is is a, is a concern, and I think it's got to be weighed more than just lightly. Sure. Um, the second bond, we've talked about the first bond. What's the intent of the use of the second bond? Um, the one that will stay? This one here? Yeah. Um, it'll be uh, renovated, and it's the intent right now is to um, construct a new foundation underneath it, so it'll be lifted up. A new foundation will be constructed in underneath it. We're actually proposing when that has to happen to move it about 10 feet to within 10 feet of the back of the rear house. Um, how that's going to be reused, it'll certainly be preserved at that point with a new foundation and stabilized. Um, it is intended at the moment to be used for uh, community space within the building for the residents of the building. Uh, there are guidelines in the affordable housing of a certain amount of that space. Uh, and that's the intent of the use for it. Um, the ultimate use of that square footage, will again, come down to the final cost of the, the renovation of that building as to whether or not it's going to be feasible to use it for that purpose. Um, if it's not used for that purpose, it will be preserved and uh, the community space will be, um, will be elsewhere inside the building. Okay, the Southgate House is going to be renovated externally? Yes. Okay, because I took a drive down there and I thought it needed some renovation. 
<laughs> so, uh, and I'm usually oblivious to that, so if it caught my attention. <laughs> um, and so that I'm assuming that the architecture of what may or may not happen to the Southgate House will mimic what's going to happen with the new construction. Yes. Okay, so that we have some sort of symmetry between the buildings, even though you know, I understand the historic value, but some sort of symmetry. And what about landscaping? You will come before us, I'm not pinning you down now, but with a landscaping plan. Yep. And what about snow removal? Has that been thrown on the, uh, on the table for consideration how snow removal is going to take place? Um, we haven't discussed it yet. Okay. There, there's certainly room for snow removal. Um, that we didn't, I didn't talk about some of the, the, uh, the storm drains either. Um, right now, the plan, because the two play together, the, okay, there's areas of the site here for snow removal on site. Obviously, if we get a winter like last winter, you know, snow may be, need to be removed off site. But there's, there's space available in this area for, for snow removal. Um, the storm drainage, and that will keep it out of any of the, st any of the storm water treatment that we have to do on the site. The project will require a Chapter 500 permit. Um, we're intending to provide uh, treatment for the runoff from the storm water along the building line with the drip edge filter. And then the drainage from the parking lot will be collected in some catch basins along this edge of the parking lot. And depending on the, uh, if we need to control, how much we need to control the rate of runoff, it will either be uh, piped to a, um, a, uh, a soil filter uh, best management practice at, in this area of the site, or if the uh, the modeling or, and the, the con control can be provided, uh, we would probably do it with a tree well filter um, type PMP in the parking lot incorporated into the landscape. Um, we'll also likely have a, uh, a land some landscaping in the front, and we'd probably do a bioretention um, practice in the front of the building that would be incorporated in the landscape. But that circles back to the, the snow removal because the, the likely and obvious place for the snow removal is in this area. We want to keep that out of any of our stormwater management areas. So that's, that's, that would be the location on site where snow could be stockpiled. Um, but obviously, if, if that becomes um, problematic, it'll have to be removed from the site. Two, two points around that. One, you, I'm sure you're taking into consideration when you talk about your stormwater maintenance, Stony Brook, and not impeding on that too much. And, and the snow removal situation. And, and number two, just to forewarn you, to help you, is that uh, have some sort of uh, management for your stormwater that we have, has to be put in writing. Okay. And the last thing that I have is, uh, I know you said it's, uh, it's town water and, and sewage, right? That's right. But you need to also talk with the sanitary district and open above that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want this prevention from running into yeah. these minor roadblocks. Nothing major, but minor. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Ron. John? I was liking it towards the end, but <laughs> <laughs> happy with the project. You've got some challenges to deal with. Uh, you still want to see the parking issue dealt with. And I don't have a problem putting some parking spots out front if to make this board comfortable. Other than that, everybody's addressed everything. Any issues that I had written down, good luck. All right, we'll save some more material for, material for you on the next one. Um, Mike. Go the other direction. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll start with the, with the barn, maybe, and the, and the uh, concern the fire department may have. Um, on your depiction, and I think you just explained it, when you renovate the barn right behind the Southgate house, you got your intention is to move it towards Route 1, and hence the reason why it shows a space between the two barns where the pictures, the present condition, doesn't indicate that. Is that true? Yeah, the two, the two structures um, were built about the same time. No one knows if they were really built at the same time or not, but the only connection really between them is at the back of the, what we're calling the barn, and the, this would be the carriage barn, the massive barn, is there's a, an exterior stairway that was constructed running up the back of the barn and connecting into the carriage barn that was built um, sometime after the original construction, possibly created in the 20th century. So the only real connection between those, if you, ever, if you walk the site and take a look at it, is right is that stairway in the back right now. So. 
in, in that configuration, though, presume, uh, assuming that you're going to be able to renovate and preserve the carriage barn to some degree, which is your intention, if I heard you right, would the fire department be satisfied with just having some sort of that, um, uh, walkway right up to the front of the carriage house and then be able to reach uh, the new addition in a satisfactory manner? They thought we needed to get to the back of it. But you earlier told me that if the, if the carriage barn goes away, they still can't get to the back of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, where, where, uh, maybe I'm not, it's, I'm not saying this clear. They wanted us to get access to a point about here. And they can't do that with that separation that you show? In here? No, yeah. they can't get they, they They need access for their apparatus to get through there. They want 12 to 14 feet of hard surface, maybe gravel, not necessarily paved, but surface that can support a fire truck. They want to be able to get their ladder truck to this point. Um, I think primarily because, I don't want to speak for the fire department, but primarily because of how the roof line works. It gives them access to the to easier access to the back side of us. Okay. Uh, obviously, from the tone of my questions, I, I'm hoping you can keep the carriage barn, but, uh, but of course, uh, number one would be having uh, have an unfettered access to, to the building for, for safety reasons. Um, as far as the parking goes, um, I like the fact you don't have parking directly in front of the Southgate House, and I'm hearing that you do too. Uh, we've done this with other applicants in the past. Um, where where we have them design parking but not build it. So if over a period of time you find that the 50 lots is not enough or it's challenged, uh, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of re-engineering to go ahead and add those few lots that you may show on, on the site plan but not have it built out. Is that something you thought Yeah, about? I think it's, that's, I had thought of that. Uh, but if we were to do that right now where the plan stands, we would propose them to be located here. And again, that's within that, it's within that 250 foot shoreline zone. Right. So I think we have, I can pretty confidently say we could build three more at that spot. I don't know that we could get five more and still stay under the 20% right. threshold, but we could get three. But you could pencil those in if you can, and not build it up. Um, on Route 1, the ingress and egress to Route 1 um, left out of the uh, site to Route 1 North, is that an island in front? I'd say it's a, uh, like a two inch concrete. At that point, the, the curved island has terminated uh, well ahead of our site, and then there's a, uh, uh, a concrete kind of shadow, shadow island that extends back. It's like an inlay, like a concrete inlay. Yeah, it's, you know, it's probably this one on the pavements back there, and that extends back uh, to just past this entrance here, so it's a mountable turning. Again, we, we haven't finished the, the application. I think if, if the if the study shows that there needs to be some restriction there, and that's probably, you know, it's going to have to be what it is. Okay. Um, I think someone talked about landscape a little bit, and we talked about the last time you were in front of us. Um, have you talked more about preserving the uh, mature trees, and if there's any challenges that you've met in doing that at this point in time? Um, yeah, our, our landscape architect, I don't know if I have them all marked correctly. Um, our, one of our landscape architect that looked at it really thought that it was mature. I think it's a I'll probably get it wrong, but it's a, I believe it's a Japanese maple, or it's a, it's a red leaf, what looks to me like a maple tree here, was one certainly worth providing. A number of the others in the front, although they're big, they've been pretty well limbed up and by for power lines, and I think some limbs came down this winter. Um, so we're going to have to assess which one of those um, really warrants preserving. Um, he was of the opinion that only one or two of them look, really looked like a good healthy tree. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll have a full landscape plan. Probably you know, something like what you see here. Um, you know, we want to preserve sort of the view of the, of the house, but, you know, complement it as well. And not obscure either. Okay. Well, like the rest of the board, from what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the opportunity that this office, not just the town and uh, the affordable housing uh, market, but also the uh, Dunson area. So I uh, wish you luck and look forward to your next, your next uh, return. Thanks, Mike. Um, I also think this is a very promising project, both in terms of the, the type of housing it provides and, and the, the opportunity for Dunstan. Um, and I'll sort of run through some of the usual sketch plan liner list of things. It's just mostly kind of a recap of what others have, have already pointed out. Um, but I do have one or two questions. It, did you say earlier that there are seven existing apartments? In the in the Southgate House, yes. Are those occupied? 
That's what is this may be something more for the for the gentleman from Avesta, but uh, what is the plan for the existing residents? They may or You'll may need to come to the podium, okay. please. Thanks. So, uh, we, we haven't determined whether or not they will need to be relocated at the time that construction begins. Uh, our current timeline uh, involves financing and approval and falls in place. Uh, we would estimate construction to start sometime next July or August. Uh, we certainly would not expect the tenants to relocate before that time. Mm -hmm. um, and we are currently looking to see if the tenants in place now will qualify for the new house. Right. So, that's certainly a priority. Maybe for the benefit of the board and the public, you kind of quickly outline what those tax credit eligibility guidelines are in terms of the, the income tiers. Uh, so we will be targeting units at 50 to 60 percent of area to median income. For Scarborough, that will be roughly $27,000 for a one-person household, on up to 44 to $45,000 for a four-person household that may qualify over the, the two bedroom units. Okay. Presumably you'll be, in terms of the existing residents, to the extent someone's not eligible and you're funded and ready to move forward, you'll be subject to governing displacement regulations and, and yes. we'll to make sure that they're... Depending on the financing right. sources that we have, um, we may need to follow the Uniform Relocation Act, which is a set of guidelines and requirements for relocating tenants that are currently in place. Okay. Thanks. I think that actually was my only question per se, um, just a few comments. I think in terms of the, the architecture certainly to me um, looks attractive and, and fully understand what you're trying to do and, and the constraints you're working with given the historic program requirements and just the, the nature of the site and the way the buildings relate to each other. So I'm looking forward to seeing that develop further as we, as we go forward. Um, you're Sounds like you're on the right path and engaged with the fire department about fire fire lane access. Um, you got to spend some more time on figuring out what will happen with that barn, keeping in mind that it could prove to be a, a safety liability. Obviously, the traffic and the left turn analysis in particular is a big X factor. Um, you know, it's just as a quick anecdote, anecdote in my almost nine years on the board, this board um, voted down one project based on the merits, and it was just down the hill from this. Um, we've had others that didn't go forward for various reasons because of feasibility, and it was clear that it was going to be an uphill battle. Um, but there was a site a little further down, a little closer to the marsh, where we had some, uh, I think there were one or two of us here from, from that iteration of the board. There were some real concerns about traffic safety, given the, the nature of, of, of that stretch of Route 1 across the marsh. This is up on the hill a little more, um, and I, while there are still some high speeds, I think it's definitely a, um, not quite the same level, um, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're anticipating the possibility that you may be somewhat constrained there. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you're enough into the Dunstan area that it's not quite the same level of, of uh, Hazard overall. Yeah, we're expecting the signal, you know, the proximity to that new signal uh, that's going to provide some queuing and some, Great. some gaps in traffic. Okay. Great. Um, landscaping is another one we'll want to see more detail on, in particular, well, at least in, including the, uh, the screening or the buffering at the front, given that it sounds like there's general support for the idea of having some parking in front of the, the building envelope. Um, and we always like to, we always like to see more uh, landscaping detail in general. Uh, in terms of the historic process, and this actually might be another question for for Avesta. Um, my understanding is that this will be utilizing federal historic tax credits. Will it also be utilizing the state historic credit program? Uh, yes, we will be working both the tax credit program. Okay, and is it? Uh, in Maine, do, do they sort of 
piggyback on the National Park Service process for the most part in terms of the, like the Part 1 and Part 2 yeah. approvals? That's correct. So typically the, the federal requirements are a little bit stricter once you get on the federal registry, it's a little bit easier than the board with the state. So we'll be pursuing that the federal portion okay. um, And I agree, Ron, it is a little, it, it is sort of unusual that the National Park Service administers that. It seems counterintuitive to some people <laughs> who aren't familiar with it. Um, given that, um, and just given the, 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 how important that is, those processes are to your design and, and um, everything ripples out to parking and other things, I'd like to ask that you, uh, in, future, in a future submission, if you could provide copies of, of the, the historic uh, credit applications that you've submitted to this point, and any you know any conditional approvals or anything along those lines. I mean, we're obviously not going to be the governing body here and determining what happens with that, but I think it would be helpful context for us to see um, what's going into that and and kind of how that ends up impacting your design. We can certainly provide that. Okay, thanks. Let's see if I'm missing anything else. You've talked about Phillips Brook and the shoreland zoning. And we think we've pretty much covered it all. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, well, I, I would, if you don't mind, um, Rick Duty, the architect, um, just pulled me aside. I, I kind of moved right through his piece of this. So he had a couple, a couple items that he'd like to address about the building architecture. Take a few minutes. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Caduti, and I don't really need to elaborate on what Dan said. I just wanted to answer if I saw the questions that you guys asked, but I think I might be able to answer a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, you talked about the front yard a lot in terms of the uh, significance of the front lawn in relation to the building. And uh, I keep referring to it as a photograph in one of the conference rooms back here. And the uh, photograph is, 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 uh, shows the front lawn and and state the nature of the building and the front yard is a very important part of that. And the Park Service will absolutely look at that and they would probably say no to parking in front. I can't be sure of that, but they'll definitely consider, they'll, they consider all the aspects of the entire site, buildings, site, new buildings, parking. They weigh things differently than different parts, more than other parts, certainly. But uh, in this case, they'll, uh, they'll absolutely be um, have their eye on with the front yard. And, and as they will with the back, the full fronts. Um, this one is, is, is the one that is, causes everybody the most concern because it is in real disrepair. But the Park Service has a way of trying to evaluate how much of a project is significant, how many things that we're doing add to the significance of the overall historic character of the finished product. And when a lot of things have disappeared, like a lot of the interior character, we start putting more weight on things that may or may not be as important um, otherwise. In this case, uh, we asked, um, and it's very difficult to ask the Park Service a question without having to wait 30 days for an answer. So we, we have a we have a consultant. The consultant usually asks the state a historic person. The state historic person usually gets nervous because we're asking a tough question, and they wait to talk to the federal historic person. And the federal historic person says, "I'll get back to you in a month." So we we tend to take a very conservative uh, outlook on how to address these issues. So and does our consultant. And when we said. We want to take two. We want to take the two middle buildings down. The two existing buildings that are here, the little mm -hmm. extra shoebox building, and then the two-story building. They were okay with that. But the second we said we wanted to mess with the, um, the barn, they said no. And we said, well, how about if we just take the barns down and rebuild them exactly the way they were built before? No. You have to prove to us that it's infeasible to rebuild the building. So we can't sit there and say, well, we're going to argue about it because we, 
you know, every question we had asked, they have to wait 30 days to get an answer. So the best thing I can say about this barn here is this one is is sort of beyond the realm of reasonable renovation, but we can get our hands around it. This one is just gonzo. So um, we we have we have decided that a, a way to approach it is to stabilize the building. To answer your question, stabilize the building and make it safe, and 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 uh, deal with the exterior of the building without really dealing with the interior of the building. Keep people away and keep people away from it. this building. Um, once we got to the point where we said, well, we're going to deal with this building, we actually think that we can um, make a nice statement with it. And we actually think that we can make it as a, as a, as a nice link between the existing house and, uh, um, and our new building. And again, in that same picture that's in the other room there, both arms are there and they both have an impact on the overall picture. Um, so on the one hand, um, I'd like to say that we're going to be able to do that. We hope to do it. We're going to try to do it with the second one. Um, uh, it, 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 there, would, there would be at some point an option to take that down after a certain amount of time. And that would be up to the owner when, he gets, when they get to that point if they want to do that or not. But for the time being, I think that we're going to have to live with both of those two months. And I think we're also going to want to respect the front yard because it relates to the building. But wait a minute. Uh, let me interrupt you. We're, again, let me bring the fire department back in, and I'm referring to all of this discussion tonight that that may be an impossibility to, to maintain that building in any shape, manner, or form. When we get to a point where a private, when we get to a point where the fire department says we have to have access to that side of the building, otherwise this project doesn't go, then we have something that we can go to the park service with and say. Can we relocate it? Can we do this? Can we do that? <coughs> it's not an easy process to go through. It's, it's actually very difficult. It doesn't have to be as difficult as it is, but it is. Um, the person who does the reviewing for the state of Maine, she has so many projects she doesn't, she can't keep up with it. She won't, we're not even, you know, architects and land planners aren't even allowed to talk to her. We have to go through consultants and state, state officers. So, um, when we when we go to them and say and we can't you know we just can't do it arbitrarily when we go to them and say that there's a real concern that we can't go forward with this project they will look at what other options they um, they can come up with as you can imagine they are faced with developers and builders and architects who come in and say this is what we ought to do and you know it may or may not be you know a, a project survival. Uh, request that they're making. So in this case, we have that. we'd have to go through that process. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next thing I want, someone asked about, I can't remember who asked about it, what was the extent of the renovation, oh, sure. the extent of the renovations of the existing building. So the park service, again, um, the, exi the existing building, the house, if, if the uh, porch around the building it's determined that it's a significant part of the overall character of the building, that it's, its addition is significant in terms of the original building, and they determine that we have to save it, then we'll have to start there and we'll have to rebuild that porch to back to its, for, for eligibility for the text service, we'll have to rebuild it back to its original um, intent and character and quality, uh, well, which, which, which is considerable because the porch is in tough shape. Uh, the masonry will probably be all, um, all, of, all the mortar will be cut and repointed. The masonry will, the mortar will have to be, the mortar will be sent to a place in Chicago to be tested to determine the type of aggregates they put in the mortar to um, determine how to match what's there. Um, the windows will have to be, all windows will be removed and will, and will be subject to um, determining what was the closest to the original window that was put in. We'll have to make a mock-up of that. Uh, we'll have options to do it in wood or wood-clad aluminum. We won't be able to use aluminum. We won't be able to use vinyl. 
uh, we'll have to meet, we'll have to make the glass lights exactly the way they were before. They will let us do a no paint. Uh, all the trim work will have to be uh, restored in detail or placed in detail. The roof will have to be, the roof will, we can replace the roof as the roof is now. So with the asphalt shingles now, we can replace the roof shingles. If it were slate, we'd have to deal with the slate. We couldn't take the slate out. We're not going to take the um, the, uh, the interior, a lot of the interior, there are some interior characteristics that are there. They'll all, every interior, every interior characteristic that still remains will have to be preserved. There's a nice front stairway inside that has to be preserved. The shape of the rooms we have to be preserved, or to preserve the space, the quality of the space when you get in there. So it's fairly extensive. And you, when you ask for the application, the application that you're really asking for, the part one is, is this building significant when you get the part one? It is significant. Part two is, is a 30, 20, 10, 20, 30 page document that identifies all those items that I just mentioned. You have to describe the existing condition of parts, and then you have to describe what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, and then you have to do the drawings, supplement it, send it to the Park Service, and they approve it. And then once it's done, and, and um, you photograph it, the, uh, the state person comes down and photographs it. They send the photographs into the Park Service. The Park Service reviews the photographs, the renovation, and if they deem it appropriate, then you've got your, your tax credits. So um, that's what we have to do to preserve the building, and that's what they ask us to do, and that's what we'll have to provide for the process. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard to do it. Um, the last question I had was um, that I wanted to address was the character of the new building as it relates to the existing building. And, and you used the word symmetry, and I don't think that's the word that I would use to describe what we tried to create. What we tried to create was a feeling of uh, a farm, a farm area uh, with a house and a barn, and um, what we tried to do was to create a barn-like building that would be compatible with what someone might have as a as an idea of how a barn might relate to a, a, a style of house that this is, and that's what we tried to do. We tried to keep the scale of the building down. We tried to keep the shapes and the character of the siding and the and the uh, massing of the building be something that would fit in someone's mind, in someone's eye, mind's eye, and, and add a little twist to the fact that it's been built in 2015. My question is more how it was going to look in relation to the main house. In terms, I mean, do you do we appearance. Appearance. More appearance. that it would complement yeah. the, right. the, right. the existing. And, yeah. and so what we were concerned about um, was the size of the building. And and both in terms of length and width, and also in height. And actually, we looked at mostly in height. And what we tried to do is to bring the height of the building down. Um, as you might see with with uh, as you would see with uh, a barn that might be compatible with this type of building. So so while it's actually a four-story building back here. Here it's, it's uh, three levels, and we extended the roof line down so that the wall wouldn't be so high and would have more of a barn shape quality. And we used materials and window shapes that we felt were compatible with, again, a barn element, and that we tried to incorporate and use the existing barn, which is right here, as a connecting element from the existing building to the barn. Good. Okay. Good Great. Cool. Thank you. Just Roger. a quick question. question. Uh, um, on the original house, it's brick. Mm -hmm. is, is that the original color on that? Do you know? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, okay. And then on the windows in the new mm -hmm. section, will lo they also have to be the same materials as in the Stonegate house? No. Okay. They, okay. they won't. They will. They wouldn't want us to do that. When I say okay. that, the park service would want us to. Um, Make our statement about what the new building is, as it as the building relates to the to the site and to the rest and to the existing building. They wouldn't. They don't want us to replicate things in the new building to copy what was in the old. Okay. When we do the old, they want us to, to replicate what was there. But when we add something, they want it, a little differentiation, but but in a compatible way. Okay. 
thanks. Everybody all set? Sure, um, Susan. And make it clear, I'm not somebody who wants parking in the front. <laughs> and I think, I think, I think in general, we were what we were saying was we were comfortable with that, the sort of the yeah. the parking along the, the edge the of the site that yeah. that happens to extend beyond the front of the building right. footprint. As opposed to across the front. Not that we wanted parking in right. front of the building, right? No right. Okay. I just want okay. To well, thank you. And is, is there anything else that you have for us in terms of feedback that you need? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, I think you, you know what your homework is, and we'll look forward to seeing it next time. Thanks. <laughs> Item number seven. Go Green Landscaping, Inc. requests a planned development review for development of property located at 4 Royal Ridge Road, Assessor's Map, U37, Lot 18. Jay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you just noted, uh, this application is before the board for a planned development review of a 12,000 square foot retail and office building in the B3 district. Given that the property is in excess of five acres, uh, development is required to be reviewed through the town's three-step plan development review process. Um, so the three steps for plan development are as follows. The first is a site inventory and analysis phase. The second is a master plan phase. And the third is the site plan or subdivision review phase. The, uh, the ordinance is set up to be a step measure deliberate process to go through each one of the uh, phases. It does allow for um, the board to consider site inventory analysis and, analysis and master plan in one meeting, which the applicant had requested in their documentation and during the sketch plan the board indicated that you may be generally favorable for. So as this progresses through, it's so, certainly something we can talk about. Um, but as I said, the first step in the process is the site inventory analysis phase. So I think, you know, um, at this point I'll focus my comments on that. Should the board be comfortable with the site inventory, then we can move into the master plan review. Um, so just generally, and as the board members are likely aware of, of what the site inventory analysis phase is about, it's really about identifying the opportunities and constraints on the property. You know, where, where are uh, certain natural or physical characteristics on the site that uh, maybe should be preserved and less undeveloped? Other areas that are uh, largely suitable for development. The outcome of a site inventory analysis phase is essentially a sort of a blob map, if you will, sort of fuzzy shaded areas that are good for development, other areas that aren't so good for development. Um, and so, again, yeah, once, once that's sort of established, um, then we move into the more uh, uh, um, detailed, so to speak, master plan, which starts to lay the concept for uh, uh, building orientation, location, those sorts of things. So uh, with that, I think, you know, I'll, I think the board should start its discussion with site inventory, and then we can move from there, and I can provide further comments should we move on from that point. Thanks, Jay. And before turning it over to the applicant, I, I just wanted to kind of add to that and note that um, staff received and, and, and passed along to the board late last week, I believe we got them on Friday afternoon, um, some revised master plan materials. Um, and that, you know, that was after what be our standard deadline for that. And so there's been no opportunity for staff or peer review of that. Um, so that the, to the extent that the applicant is interested in pursuing that iteration, um, my feeling, uh, and I'm certainly open to feedback from, from my fellow board members, but my feeling would be that um, given that, that we focus our discussion this evening on the site inventory piece and then consider the master plan at a, at a future time when uh, staff uh, peer reviewers and the board have had more of an opportunity to review that. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there, and with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Great. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Lee Allen. I'm one of the Civil Solutions. I'm joined tonight by Mike Richmond from Custom Concepts, Inc., and Dave Zalewski, who is 
the uh, owner of Blue Green Landscaping. Um, so, as you mentioned, I want to focus on the site inventory first and then move our discussion into the, uh, the master plan. I think there's some explanations that would, would help, usually help both of us uh, when we get to that point, but we'll start with the site inventory. Uh, the lot is located um, just to the north of the marsh. It's 8.9 acres in shape. It's kind of a, a weird shaped lot. Like this, entirely in the B3 zone. It's about 8.9 acres. Um, it's surrounded by Royal Ridge Church here, the large wetland area in here. This is the Plantation Drive and Fawn Run subdivision to the north. It's uh, accessed off the Scotto Hill Road. Route 1 is generally to the south. The marsh is over in this area. You can see that a little bit of shoreland zone, overlay zone, uh, encroaches onto the very corner of our property. Our property is accessed off the Royal Ridge Road. Um, this kind of box right here indicates plastic flooring. It's a uh, big flooring kind of warehousing type building. There's um, a very new building. I think it was just built in last year. Family Wellness Chiropractic. Uh, the People's United Bank is also located here. It's kind of a vacant lot, and number of liquidators is located here. So it's kind of a mixed use of of different types of retail office medical office type uses in this area. <coughs> kind of a more blown up version of our site. Um, there's some wetland areas on our site here and here. This, this wetland right here is actually a man-made ditch that was constructed as part of this subdivision back in the 80s. Um, the ditch and this pond have seen no maintenance whatsoever, and they've kind of filled in. So part of our work would be to restore this ditch and pond and, and actually upgrade that pond to have function in a much better manner than it is right now. Right now, um, a lot of the pipes are buried or mostly silted in, so it's barely working as, as intended. Um, these areas in here, um, we're calling some scrub shop, kind of open field, new growth forest. In here, very you know, 20 to 30 foot high trees, and, and same with we have a flat spot kind of right behind the uh, people behind the bank um, that, that's similar to that. Um, this little spit of land is a uh, 30 foot wide strip of land that goes out to Route 1. The intention is at some point to have some signage on Route 1 to indicate kind of what's back in this area. So as Jay mentioned, the kind of the final piece of the, the site inventory, site analysis, is to identify spots on this plan that are available for development. Um, so we're trying to apply it in some areas, in this area, this area, this area, right here, are all areas that we believe are development potential for office, office type buildings, medical office, um, light industrial, similar to the uses that are in this area. The unsuitable for development areas are basically encumbered by wetlands. Um, those areas kind of in here and up along this area. For the most part, even though it's overgrown, there's a lot of uh, good development potential here. Um, the one limiting factor, or one of the limiting factors we see is the amount of traffic available to come out here without a signal at Royal Ridge it is going to limit the, the future development potential of this piece. Um, talking with Bill Bray, there's this fourth leg of this intersection that gets into the industrial park here. Uh, the bank is kind of directly in the way at the moment. <laughs> you know, big dreams down the road. If, if this was to ever open up, that, that opens up development potential in this lot um, greatly. Um, it, would, it would make it a safe community. We could have a lot of um, bigger kind of big dreams of something big, a hotel or something in there that generates a lot of traffic. With that, I would be more than happy to turn it to the board for any questions on the, the site analysis, site inventory. Thank you. Mike, do you want to start?
Township, Craig Ristan. Um, Alan, would you, uh, this is this is one lot, however, right? When you speak of like, yeah, right, you're correct, one lot. I mean, so uh, how, how it gets divided up with a condo or subdivided is, is something we determine down the road. So, given its current zoning, how many how many developable lots? in terms of future development based on the existing roadway is road frontage. So certainly a, a new road would likely need to be created with a 50-foot wide right-of-way to get additional lots. Then maybe I'll do one lot split potentially, but um, probably, so just something to note, but certainly there are five acres, so there's enough land area, but there's other dimensions to take into account. Well, it looks, it looks to me like uh, uh, without without uh, having another uh, access point off Route 1, even given that constraint, a 50-foot road in or a driveway in, maybe only another lot. One right, but, but there could be, you know, kind of right. multiple buildings. Okay. That 30-foot uh, that uh, sliver that fronts Route 1, uh, is it the applicant's intention to locate a sign there? Yes. Um, and how, how would that work, really? I mean, uh, I mean, I, mo mostly I envision a sign being at a corner of, uh, you know, a, uh, a business's entrance, et cetera. Or in the case of the church, I think it's at the corner of the of, of the road itself in Route One, Royal Ridge Road in Route One. Um, is that kind of problematic as far as seeing a sign? How many feet away from the entrance? Oh, you mean to Royal Ridge Road? Yeah. I mean, that's the only uh, idea. I, I think it's, it's a bigger idea, like, from sure there'd be some directional, you know, at Royal Ridge or something, or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more just to get get the advertising basically on Route 1, even though the building is like, five, six hundred feet back off the off Route 1. I think, I, I, I don't know if it's possible, sir, but I'll just throw it out there. I think ideally it'd be nice if we could just have a, a single or like one or two signs at Royal Ridge and Route 1 that direct folks into what's available up that road as opposed to, you know, adding another sign on Route 1 like that. So I guess we don't control the land there. So right. Uh, other than that, I, I don't have, uh, I, I think you covered that uh, aspect of the, um, of the discussion quite well. Um, it certainly is encouraging that you're going to make those uh, I guess there'll be stormwater retention ponds at the end of the day. Yeah, that existing pond is going to be retrofit, basically to bring that up to current standards, uh, cleaned out, maintained. Put it, right, currently, the outlet to that pond is a 24 inch pipe. There's no outlet structure, it's just a 24 inch pipe. Mm -hmm. So we would add you know, an outlet structure to that to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. Is it, when, when you're speaking to that, I was curious is, there, is the current condition of these? Um, uh, um, Ponds, if you will, uh, are they impacting any of the uh, surrounding lots in any ne negative kind of way? Not that we can see. It looks like something was happening there. I don't think they were functioning as they were designed in, in 1985 or 86. Um, but there's certainly there's a larger storm that's probably just spilling over to that level and it's not working to I guess, you know, some of us, like myself, would ask then, uh, you know, why improve it? What's the, what's the necessity behind improving because it? Because we would need to we need detention for ourselves, and it's downstream of everything that we'd be doing, and there's capacity there to do what we need to do. So I'd say why reinvest the wheels there? We could just clean it up and get something that's not functioning capacity to get it to work. Um, we've kind of already looked at the other buildings, the, the church and the classic flooring building on that pond, and with the tributary area from that plus what we have, um, without expanding it very much, we could get all of it. Basically, the whole situation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Uh, before we move on with board discussion, I was remiss in, in not highlighting the fact that we do have the opportunity for public comment on this item. So, if there's anyone who's interested, come on up. All right. Seeing none, we'll continue. And we'll go to you, John. I'm good with this part of it. I've got some questions at the plan development stage as far as zoning and some other uses, but as far as this is concerned, I'm all set, Lee, and 
Chair, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ron? Yeah, I said a couple of questions and one for two to both. If we're just a proposed lease, area development, and that's going to be off the Royal Ridge Road, right? Yeah. Okay. Then next to that, hypothetically speaking, it says future development hotel, hotel office, or whatever. Okay. Could that also be obtained through that same off the Ridge Road, possibly? Yeah, so, yeah, kind of looking at the master plan phase, but the one would be to extend where Royal Ridge takes on 93 then extend up for an office and access to what we're calling our proposed development. And then right before that, you could make a, another 90 degree T off of that to access kind of that back portion of that hotel and then across that drainage ditch. because there would be two roads. Okay. The reason why I bring that up is that in presentation, uh, it talked about bike and pedestrian. Again, waving the magic wand. If that were <coughs> to occur at some future date, then there would be some concern about pedestrian and bike routes and so forth and so on. Yeah. Um, at, at present, based on what we know and what we're proposing here, there's currently no bike and pedestrian activity out there at all. There's no place to go. It's called more of a light industrial, so that's why we're not... I, I understand that, but I'm just saying that if there was future development, then, then that certainly would be a factor in the, in the scheme of things. Yes. Hey, I just wanted to point that out. Other than that, at this stage, I don't have any other comments. Thanks, Ron. Nick? I don't have any questions at this time. Thanks. Roger? <coughs> uh, I don't either. I'm also okay. Susan? No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I really have anything else that hasn't been raised. Um, pretty well highlighted the, the challenges or the limitations or constraints posed by the, the access um, that's available. Um, and we talked about uh, site drainage and uh, some of the other characteristics. So with that, maybe you could sort of uh, talk a little bit about the master plan and, and, and sort of highlight what was different about what was submitted yeah. late this past week, and then we can take it from there. Great, thank you. Thanks. <coughs> so the master plan phase is basically looking at developing what could hypothetically happen on the rest of the property. Um, so the, one of the things that we really didn't discuss is that Royal Ridge Road is, um, contains municipal water, municipal sewer, overhead electric, um, everything that we'd need to extend. So they're all right here, it's, it's close by. Um, this building right here is what we're proposing to be the, the new headquarters for green landscaping. Um, this is future office space. This is kind of future unspecified office. Could be hotel, could be something big, could be something generic general office. Um, same with this right here. So how we're accessing, and I think Ron brought this up, be extending some road infrastructure here, and also extending some road infrastructure in here to gain access to parking areas in the building. Um, nothing magical about the layout, it's just kind of how it all fell together, trying to think with this type of building, assuming this could be a two or three story building, how much parking would we need, and just how does that fit on the property and back into it, make sure that all works from a, a spatial kind of orientation. That's, that's how we came up with it. We also look to minimize wetland impacts. Um, we were able to stay away from except for this road crossing here. Um, very little, if any, I, we wouldn't even need a NERPA permit. We'd be right around that 4,300 square feet plus or minus, so really wouldn't need a permit. So we would use all those constraints and kind of laid out something that we thought would work. Um, utilities obviously would be extended in through these roads. Whether it's split up into lots or it's all one big condo, that's something that's down the road. That we weren't even honestly thinking of that other than knowing we needed to get roads to get from point A to point B to point C. Um, so we laid this out. This, this plan meets the zoning. The zoning is D3. 
Um, it's our opinion that B3 zoning is intended for a lot of Route 1 development right up next to Route 1. This is clearly off of Route 1. We're five to 600 feet back from Route 1. So we think there's things in the B3 zoning that may not exactly apply to us. And kind of how we've laid out this building, we got talking about it and going back and forth and we just weren't feeling like it was the best that we could do. Um, and we went through multiple iterations. And the material we sent to you was kind of our brainstorming sitting around the table saying, could we do this better? Is there a better way to do this? And the answer we think is yes. Um, and I'm going to have Mike get up and, and do some explanation of, of why we think yes. Um, but before we do, there's, there's another part of this um, proposal, and that is outdoor storage. So we have an outdoor storage area where we're going to store sand and mulch and crushed stone. And we're proposing that back in this. Those aren't parking areas. Those are actually kind of concrete segregated bins for, for everything, the sand, the mulch, and everything to keep them separated. It would be screened with ID in the building. Um, so really, it's kind of out of sight. It was similar with the other one. It was kind of behind the building, and in the back, it was also going to be screened. The point of it is, is that we need to go to the zoning board um, on June 10th to get a special exception for this. So the reason we changed this one is because we like it, but we wanted to present this to you to see and have feedback with the board to make sure that we're going down the right track so that we can make sure we go to the zoning board and they're on board with a plan layout similar to this. That would be something that we'd have to change in the next day or two with them to make sure that, that we're on the agenda for that. Because otherwise, it's a, it's a month away in the process. And then we can't get site plan approval until we have zoning board approval. So that's kind of our thinking behind why we're presenting this to you tonight, because we really need the feedback to make sure we can keep this thing on schedule so we're only delayed maybe three more weeks instead of, uh, instead of a month and three weeks. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike um, and let him kind of explain where we're heading. Corey, if I might just, sure. um, before Mr. Richmond sort of goes through his uh, uh, his bit, um, I did have an opportunity to speak with Brian Longstaff, our zoning administrator, who staffs the Board of Appeals and try to get, you know, because this is a, a bit unique. Typically, if a Board of Appeals special exception is required, um, that's accomplished before even coming to the planning board, but where we're in a plan development review process where we have these three separate phases, we felt it appropriate to come to the board for site inventory and master plan, sort of start to generally lay out the site, and then the applicant would approach the Board of Appeals, which of course they would need to have their approval before we start doing the more formal and specific site plan review. One of the things I talked to um, uh, Mr. Longstaff about today in regards to sort of the, the uh, potential to revise the approach um, to, to where the outdoor storage may be, because my understanding is the submission they've made to the Board of Appeals is what was the original submission made to this board as well, was, you know, recognizing that this board, through your review processes of the plan development, you have um, very specific criteria in terms of design. We also have the commercial design standards, which really codify sort of where things need to be located on the site. The Board of Appeals review for a special exception, their language is more general in nature. It's more neighborhood fit and less specificity about where it is on site. So one of the things we talked about was, you know, if the Board of Appeals were to take their review, you know, their review would be more general in terms of, and I'll step back a little bit, sometimes what the Board of Appeals does, they approve, what they approve is what needs to be built. You know, your building is five feet from the lot line, you know, that's, that's the best it can be. It's a variance and it's very specific. But where this is a special exception for a use that that the board, the Board of Appeals review would be about general allowances, much like a contract zone process that we've gone through where the, where the council sort of says, okay, this type of activity um, is okay on this site. So let's say that's it. Now planning board, you do the detail work. You know, you tell us where parking should be and how much is okay. That would be similar to that. So just sort of lay that out that the board, you know, because I know the concern of the applicant is, 
you know, boy, if we don't get master plan tonight, then we're not looking at zoning board until potentially July or August, and oh my gosh, how far that, you know, I, I do think there's a way that even if we don't get to master plan approval tonight, that that doesn't prohibit a uh, fully vetted discussion at the Board of Appeals in a week and a half or whatever the case may be. So I just wanted to lay that out for the applicants sort of uh, so they can feel good about wherever we wind up tonight and the board can also, you know, feel like you, you're not being painted into a bit of a corner because you know, we always try to be, uh, you know, sensitive to the um, needs and such. So um, I just wanted to lay that out for you. Thanks, Jay. That's, that's helpful. Sorry, uh, over. Mike Richmond, Custom Concepts Architecture, um, and I will be brief with this and, and respect, um, you know, the position we put you in, so to speak. Uh, living proof here that the design process sort of evolves every day. And like we said, we submitted this and then sort of looked at it, looked at other projects in the community and said, you know, this particular situation, I think we need to rethink this. Um, basically, it's unique because, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a working building. So unlike an office building or a medical building where us as designers have multiple fronts, um, this particular one, because of its use, light industrial, you know, it's a landscaping company and hopefully, you know, electricians, plumbers, those sorts of things, the building needs to have a, a backside, if you will. It's not going to have, it doesn't, it doesn't want a lot of windows. Um, you know, it's a working building. So once we started to look at it, we really felt that the building, in a way, was turning its back towards the public view. We purposely designed this building together, um, sort of L-shaped, you know, very welcoming, and felt that as soon as we turned it around, it, it's, it's not really addressing what the public wants to see. Um, we also have put a lot of effort and expense, expected expense, into dressing up the front of the building, what I would call the front. The overall style, as you can see in the previous drawing, you know, it's a nice barn style look. The overhead doors that we'd like to use, and these are kind of hard to see from where you are. Um, we'd like to use more traditional type barn style looks on the front. Nice product, nice texture. We'd like to install small roofs over the panels, over the windows, over the doors. Some nice lighting. So we're here requesting this because we really feel that the, the building that faces the public corridor should be our best face. And there's no question in our mind anyway that the, the front of the building, as shown in the updated drawing, uh, is definitely the best face of the building. Thank you. Mike, do you want to let us take a look at that? There's a group pressing it down there. Uh, And while we're doing that, and, and we can uh, I certainly open it up for more board discussion, but I guess my feeling is well, I, I really appreciate the, the, the efforts and the, and the motivation to, to make it better, and I understand that the designs do evolve. Um, the fact is that, at least I, I don't know if anyone else had more time over the weekend, but I haven't had a chance to look at this and I'm looking at it up there right now and I can sort of generally barely make out um, what the configuration is um, and we're seeing some, you know, so, some helpful images uh, but still no real time to digest things. So um, given that and given what Mr. Chase described in terms of the process as it relates to the Zoning Board of Appeals, my feeling is that we defer uh, defer discussion and feedback on the on the master plan until another time. Um, I just uh, I don't feel comfortable being put in the position of, of having to sort of deliberate over something that I haven't really been able to study. Um, but I'm just one person. I'm the chair, but I'm just one vote. Um, so that's where I am. I'll agree with you 100% on this. I'm just concerned to see it. I'm not prepared to put it at this point. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I can go either way. Yeah, right. uh, I'm not, I don't have a strong sense. Of, what are we talking about as, quote, delay? 
Um, tonight, tonight, the intent was to get final site plan approval. No. No. The, the, as I, you know, the, this is a three-step process. So we've gone through site inventory. Board has generally said, yep, you know, the developable areas are what you've identified. Then the, the ordinance basically lays out that these are to be taken as three separate steps. But the ordinance does allow for permission for the board to consider site inventory and master plan in one meeting if the board sees fit. One of the areas. As Can I interrupt you there? Yes, Can, does the ordinance allow the board to consider master planning and site plan approval in one it, meeting? Does it doesn't it speak to that. It doesn't speak to that. So that means that it is permissible. So in 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 reality, we can. This this may not result in any real delay. But we can review all those con those pieces in one meeting. Although at a, future at a subsequent meeting. Yes. I might offer that where you know when you read the plan development process, it is, it is very much a step and deliberate process as, uh, to be taken in sort of these measured measured ways. Where the ordinance specifically says steps one and two can be combined, but it's, it's silent on that third step. The master plan approval is what's supposed to set the course for the site plan. Mm -hmm. So it really provides an opportunity for the applicant before they start sinking hard engineering money into coming up with, um, you know, full traffic analysis to know to have some assurity and the board has some assurity that this is indeed the pattern that fits. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure that there is a, a, the ability for the board to take master plan and site plan in the same meeting. Well, it sounds to me like there is, and, and I'll, I'll have to read. Yeah. Um, and also, I might suggest that uh, that that singular step and that very, very deliberate and careful. Well, they're all going to be careful, certainly. Sure. But that deliberate step might be for something that's a little bit more substantial. I don't see this as a uh, as a truly large um, site that uh, requires potentially does not require as much time and effort from the board. But that's my view. What? More do you need from us to go to the Board of Appeals, I guess. Uh, my part of the discussion that we just had and Jay elaborated on, I believe Rob said, it's just more of this is this useful out in this area where I think we're, we have everything we need to do that. Okay, then I can wish it was you. <laughs> noted. Thank you. And am I might. Um, oh, okay. I was just going to, uh, I mean, that, that's at the risk of the applicant as to what they're presenting today and whether they want to come back potentially uh, asking us after their site analysis piece whether we want to move right into a site plan review or, mm -hmm. you know, geared towards potentially approving it. I mean, that's totally at their risk, though. So I think based on the feedback they're going to get tonight, I think they'll feel uh, better or worse as to what, what road they want to take and how they want to make their next presentation. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Not to money the waters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I will anyway. Um, <clears throat> I do. I do. Um, it's here. I liked your first iteration of this better, and I say that because you have a working building that is now going to be facing two roadways that have potential expansion development in front of it, and a parking field in front of it. I think you had it right the first time. That, for what it's worth, I think you had it right the first time. But go ahead. That's it. I'm muddied enough. Yeah. All right. I think we're good and muddy. Uh, Roger. Um, I I agree with Nick on the uh, on the layout of the of the building and everything that's on this plan here. Uh, I think that's what you're referring yeah. to. Uh, but I will defer it to all my experienced colleagues in the, on the other <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Was waiting. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I think we have, I think we have a consensus, and I, I think you've gotten some good feedback. I'm not quite sure where to take it from here, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm hearing is that your next submission to the planning board would be a master plan submission, again, going through the criteria, sort of explaining how, like you did with your last one, having the project be, um, the, the, the 
development narrative, the neighborhood impact, sort of all those narrative assessments that are to go along with and accompany the master plan that you've demonstrated here tonight and how you're meeting design standards and the D3 plan development standards. Um, so I think that's the next phase and that can be. Can I, uh, I'm, are we also uh, telling the applicant that if they wish they can they can make a presentation for the next phase also? Or that's or plan site inventory. I think if that's the direction the board wants to provide the applicant, certainly I would say please feel free to do so and staff will certainly work to ensure that the ordinance language allows for that. If it doesn't allow for that, that's what we do. If it does allow for it, we certainly uh, want to respect what the board's mm -hmm. wishes are. I, I think, well, personally, if, if the ordinance allows for, for an applicant to proceed that way, then, then I think we, we should allow them to consider that. So master plan and mm -hmm. sign, sign approval. Sign approval, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, I would agree with that to the extent it's supportable by the ordinance. I mean, I, I don't think any of us are here to try and create delays. Um, In fact, James, so I had this exact conversation about one comment. I, I don't like you muddying the waters, but I have to agree with you on that building. The first <laughs> site plan is better than this one. <laughs> the first, the first site plan around. with the building turned the other way is the way I prefer to see it. Um, one thing, I, I just procedural question. Um, is there a vote necessary for the site inventory? You just no, them, no, no. no. It's just, you say, okay, site, okay. site inventory, is, there's no formal vote, no formal okay. action. It's just tacit approval, and we, we okay. get to a formal vote on, at master plan. And a, I guess a quick comment slash question for me, because it's rare I feel very strongly about something, but I feel very strongly about this. It's an example of the original design here in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do not like naming names, but I think we all know where it is. Um, it's across from Cabell's. It's the exact same situation. It's a big L-shaped design like this. Yeah. Does not work. Parking fields in the back. That's what we're. The parking fields in the back. I would totally agree with that. But it is the back side of the building. It's not welcoming. They're forced to put utilities out there. You know, you can do some frosting, you can do some window dressing on it, but it is not considered successful architecture, and I don't think it's in the best interest of the town. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. In fact, when I saw it, I said, this is much more, I'm, not, I'm a little confused about how it's going to be used, but I really yeah. like what you've done, because I don't like driving by the back side of the building. No. Thank you. Well, especially if you have a choice. Here. If you have a choice, right. 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 I, I think those of us who have been on the board for a little bit, we all have a couple of those. We have a couple of those. Whenever we two, pass three them. Here and there. We, and we, we do try and build on that. So we appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Item number eight, Maine Life Care Retirement Community requests a final site plan review as part of the contract zone amendment process for proposed additions of Piper Shores Retirement Community Development, Assessor's Map R101, Lot 5. Jay? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's see. So this is uh, down Piper Shores. They're seeking a addition, which this board has seen a couple of times. Um, certainly, as you, you'll note, this uh, site is subject to a contract zone that was approved in the late 90s, and the applicant has gone before the council and received approval to amend that original contract zone to allow for the proposed expansion. As we sort of talked about a few moments ago, it is now up to the board to determine if the details of that expansion are satisfactory. The board had reviewed this item, I believe it was back in April, um, and provided a preliminary approval, at which time there were still a few outstanding staff comments. Subsequent to the April meeting, as I just mentioned, applicant went and saw council, received their contract zone approval, and they're now back for final approval. 
Um, by and large, staff, uh, the applicant did a nice job of responding to staff comments, and at this point, between uh, planning staff and uh, Woodard and Kern, our peer reviewer, we really didn't have any significant comments other than um, uh, a drive aisle width in a sort of, I'll call it a satellite parking field. Board members might recall during preliminary, <laughs> preliminary review, the applicant had requested for 24 foot wide drive aisles rather than the standard 25 foot. Staff, peer reviewer, and the board even seem generally comfortable with including that waiver. As I just mentioned, there seems to be a satellite parking space, uh, area that has 21 foot, and um, we believe that might be, could prove problematic um, for standard vehicles to move in and out of. And at this point, that's really our only remaining comment. Staff has prepared a condition of uh, a motion with a condition of approval for the board if you are so inclined to get to that point tonight. I will note, and I'm not sure if I put this in our comments or not, we have received their amended DEP permit, so we do have that in hand. That's all I have for you at this point. Thank you, Jay. And I'll start over the applicant. Thanks very much. Good evening. My name is Mike Tadamo Whelan. I'm a civil engineer with Faith Crawford and Storm Dice. I'm here with uh, several members of the Prefecture design team. Um, great introduction, Jay. Thank you. Uh, as Jay mentioned, we were last before you on April 21st. We received preliminary approval. Since that time, we've received approval from the DEP. Uh, we've received approval for the contract zoning amendment from the council, and we've also received approval from the uh, trustees of the Scarborough Sanitary District. Uh, there were some very small changes made to the plan since preliminary approval that were uh, done primarily uh, in response to comments from staff and peer review. I'll walk through those um, really quickly and then get some questions. Uh, really, the, the primary changes um, have to do with parking. Um, and, and they're very minor. There's, there's a net increase uh, in parking by two spaces over what we previously, pro uh, previously proposed. Um, and largely that's the result of the structural engineer being able to shift some columns under the building and, and provide some more efficient parking under the building. We did eliminate a few spaces out on the site. The first one is uh, at a, what, what could be considered a, a relatively tough turning radius for a, a service vehicle, so we eliminated the space, increased the radius to make the, the turning movement easier. Uh, we also added a, a parking space and a Chevron sort of loading area uh, in front of the entrance to the facility uh, for shuttle service. Uh, so there was a, a space loss there, and we've also eliminated the space at the entrance to the community garden, uh, with, with Chevron striping again, uh, to allow uh, people accessing the garden to, to get in and out uh, of a gate there with, uh, with materials for gardening, you know, whether that be loam or compost or what have you. So again, uh, with the proposal at this point is 281 parking spaces, the contract zoning agreement requires require 273, so there's a surplus of eight, uh, and, and this is two more than um, than we talked about back in April. The other change to the plan uh, was the addition of uh, a piece of mechanical equipment, so west of this parking area here, um, it, it'll be behind a retaining wall, and it'll sit lower than the retaining walls. So we did that in an effort to sort of screen it. Um, as Jay mentioned, we, we did discuss a waiver um, for the parking, for the drive out width at the last meeting, and primarily that was to maintain consistency with the existing drive outs out there. Um, the, the one law that Jay talked about that we, there's a 21 foot wide drive out with the satellite lot out here. Um, we just received a comment from, from staff and the peer review engineer that they think that it's a little tight. Uh, we've gone back and we've looked at the plan and uh, we've devised a way to shift the edge of the pavement over three feet, um, sort of on the south edge. This, the fence surrounding the garden will, will move three feet as 
well, so the drive aisle width um, is able to go to 24 feet to match the rest of the parking site. So um, if the board feels that it's um, acceptable, it's requesting conditional approval, um, that change be a condition. Um, the only other thing I'll say is um, the project is on a very tight schedule. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any board comments, particularly on the, the parking solution? Uh, I've got two comments. Uh, one question, one, well, two questions actually. One of my colleagues the last time asked if you had events there as far as additional parking is concerned, how is that going to be accommodated? Sure. Yeah, I. I talked about that a little at the, at the last uh, meeting, and I think Jim had a moment to address it, and, and I'll, I'll try to summarize what he said. And Jim, if I didn't uh, speak, you can certainly um, correct me. But um, <coughs> so, in the event of where there, if there is a, a large event and it requires parking, there is uh, some satellite parking available on the campus for irregular use, it, it's really down. Uh, off, off another branch of Piper Road, up near a uh, um, near maintenance facility, and so they provide they provide shuttle service uh, in those instances, and they, they do that today when, when they have events, and I think that practice would continue. My, my second question is, uh, what are the hours of construction going to be? Because you have a butters there, and, uh, uh, and you know, I want to make sure that there's going to be understanding the reality of building uh, as little disruption with them as possible. So has that been discussed? Yeah, not to my knowledge, and, and so off the top of my head, I'm not sure if there's, a, if there's an ordinance requirement for that yet, if there is. We have a local noise ordinance, I think. 7 a.m.? 7 a.m. is start time. What about finish time? Uh, off the top of my head, I can't quite recall, but I think it's probably six or seven at night, something to that effect. So let's see what I can find for you here. Just trying to anticipate that a lack of phone calls to town hall because I can see it coming from some of the neighbors to the situation over there. Yeah. If there's a lot of noise and a lot of construction uh, out of the ordinary quote unquote normal time span. Yeah. I mean, certainly we, we would um, we appreciate the opportunity to, to work within the department and the ordinance. Um, that said, um, Piper Shores has an interest in, in keeping our neighbors happy, uh, being, being a good neighbor, uh, and, and we'll certainly uh, make it clear to the... Not to mention its own residents, I would imagine, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So I think your, your comment is simply loaded and that's okay. Just wanted to make sure that that's you know really taken into serious consideration and not just a passing <coughs> by. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. John? I'm okay with it. Yeah. Mike? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'm I'm very pleased with uh, how the applicants addressed all the uh, concerns and questions of the board over the last several weeks, and uh, I'm going to support this contract on amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? I don't have any questions. I think you've done a, again, a nice job uh, addressing all of the concerns mentioned. Roger? Um, I, I agree with that, and um, I guess as long as, um, you know, traffic's always been an issue, uh, the flow and everything, and it, as long as the um, Fire department and everybody else is satisfied. I guess, I guess um, it's a go as far as I'm concerned. I'm just kind of curious as as a citizen of Scarborough, 
Um, if I were to drive down there and wanted to take a walk along some of the trails, I can do that? I won't get arrested or anything like that? Okay. Pardon me? Just tell us what day you're coming. Okay. I'm all set. All right. Thanks. Susan? I think it's um, taken a while, but as everything else on this project, it's going to be fine. We did. We crossed the T's and dotted the I's, and now we can move. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, I also think this turned out well and appreciate all the responsiveness and um, prepared to put forward a motion for approval which will include a condition which reflects the um, sort of the parking solution that you arrived at with staff. Uh, and I'd like to thank the applicant and staff for hashing that out in advance of this meeting. So settle in and listen to this motion. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if you, I think, you know, if you were so inclined, I think you could think move the, the findings as presented and then yeah. read the waivers and conditions. I think that would be an acceptable way of moving this that thought along. thought did occur to me, and I think I'll do that. Second. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I move to approve the application of Maine Life Care Retirement Community, Inc. under Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 405B, the Town of Scarborough Site Plan Review Ordinance and Chapter 406 Subdivision Ordinance with the following findings as presented. There's yeah. one waiver. Yep. The board waives the drive aisles width from 25 feet to 24 feet as depicted on the site plan sheets. And the one condition of approval is that, yep. I'm sorry, there's more than one condition of approval. Back. Yeah. I was getting greedy, okay. Uh, the first condition of approval, prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall pay peer review fees. Number two, the applicant shall submit a revised site plan demonstrating a 24-foot drive aisle width. Number three, prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater infrastructure management ordinance. And number four, prior to the issuance of the building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Second. We have a second. Ron, any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Mr. Chair, before we move to the next item, just uh, to Mr. Mazur's question, uh, our noise abatement uh, ordinance identifies same time hours at 7 to 9, Monday to Thursday, 7 to 10, Friday to Saturday, and 9 to 9 on Sunday. 9 o'clock at night? <laughs> I would hope so that we, we would take into consideration and modify that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an agreeable amount. All right, again, as noted previously, item number nine was tabled at the request of the applicant. So item number ten, Navigators Properties LLC requests a site plan review for a transmission tower at 79 Holmes Road, Assessor's Map, R33, Lot 1. Jay? Give you a chance to work a little. I think I'm there. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. As just noted, uh, this applicant is before the board for review of a new transmission tower within the recently established transmission tower overlay district. Um, as board members will recall, this is a new, uh, relatively new provision or ordinance, probably adopted within the last six to eight months at this point, that allows for the uh, development of transmission towers in, in the community. Um, provided, however, that they meet certain performance standards, which through the ordinance uh, development process were designed to provide for enhanced level of cellular service across the community, which was certainly an expressed concern by, by those involved, while also aiming to limit the overall number of towers and facilities required to meet that goal uh, throughout the community. Um, so to do that, the, the procedure for reviewing uh, telecommunication towers is really a two-step process. The first step is what's called a priority of location process. Um, you know, this was identified as, a, as being a crucial step in meeting the town's goal of, as I said, enhancing 
uh, service across the town, but also limiting the proliferation of facilities throughout town that may not be necessary where uh, co-locating or, or development of certain facilities could uh, reduce the number needed. So the board's first step that I'll, I'll sort of just, as I said, point you towards is the priority of location. Should the board be comfortable with the materials that have been submitted to date in terms of priority location, we can move into the second step, which is review of standards for transmission towers. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, again, much like our previous discussion, this is established as a very deliberate, measured process to which the board is to work its way sequentially through each of the four criteria uh, for developing a new tower. Um, Board members, at least certain board members may recall, back in December, I believe it was, we held a workshop after the uh, new ordinances went in place. At that time, the board established a policy that all applications of this ilk would go out to peer review, um, since a lot of the stuff is very technical in nature, to which uh, simple land use planners can get confused when we talk about <laughs> propagation mass and the like. Um, you call so it, you're calling us simple? I'm a simple land <laughs> <laughs> uh, So we have sent it out to Wood, Woodard and Kern uh, for, for their peer review, um, much like they do peer review for stormwater, which again is an item I you know, can understand the basics of. We rely on our experts to help us with. So they've provided some comments. Again, I think you know, we'll start with the focus on, the, on their priority location comments. Uh, in regards to really ensuring that we have the proper evidence to support um, each of the of the four criteria. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you. And we did uh, actually just say we did provide board members with uh, excerpts of the performance standards that spell out each criteria. Um, so you just have those before you, so we can work our way through those. Thank you, so Jack. Uh, as as uh, Mr. Chase highlighted, uh, this is intended to be a sort of deliberate, sequential process, and um, I think that's especially important important to keep that in mind, given that this is obviously the first time that this board is, has gone through this since the ordinance was amended. So um, just want to ask folks to bear that in mind, and with that, we'll hand it over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is uh, John Springer. I'm an attorney uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, Full disclosure, I'm not, a ma uh, I'm not a Maine attorney, but I do a lot of telecom work in New Hampshire, uh, Maine, and Vermont, um, and I'm very familiar with technology and these type of sites. Uh, I'm joined by Louis Vitale of uh, Mariner Tower Navigator Properties, they call them as Mariner Tower. Uh, Peter Marchand, who is here on behalf of HMC, and we have our radio frequency engineer, uh, Ernesto Chua, who is also here on behalf of AT&T. Um, and uh, initially, Oh, I see something going on the screen. We have a thumb drive for Power Pro. I mean, it, it may be helpful. If you have your own laptop, I'll just unplug here and you can plug right into, there's a wire right behind Mr. Sprinter that you can plug right into. And I'm a hard copy type of guy, so if I, if I try to do this, half a Scarborough is going to lose power. So I'll let uh, Lewis start with that. Yep. Karen's showing how to do that.
Thanks, Jay. Yeah. <coughs> First time that thing has been sitting there ready to plug in, of course. <laughs> Walking through, it has the address of each site, 
uh, the Latin launch. It has the height at which AT&T has its antennas on each one of those towers. And so, for instance, on the top one, on the Broadway tower, it's got its antennas at 168 feet. Um, on the bottom one at 61A McClellan, it's got 100, their antennas at 125 feet. Okay? And it gives a distance away from the proposed site in terms of mileage. And it also shows the remarks saying uh, these are all existing AT&T sites except for the Burnham Road site. I know that, that was called out in one of the staff reports. We'll be talking about that in a second. But I want to focus, if you will, first on the 61A McClellan site because that site is the one in the upper left-hand corner on that current coverage plot, the RF plot, which is ME L05030. That's the McClellan site there. And I think that's a good example to use because this site is 2.6 miles away from the proposed site and it doesn't come close to bringing coverage into the gap. And there are no towers around that can reach into the gap. <coughs> the area of the gap basically roughly bounded by Holmes Road to the south, Gorham Road to the north. Uh, I guess that's um, Route 1 coming up here on the red line. Um, and then uh, to the left. You know, main Turnpike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Main Turnpike, thank you. And then Buxton Road up there. But this technology, PCS technology, is a great technology. It's in the 1900 megahertz range. It can do a lot of things. It's an extremely popular technology. Uh, you can use the handheld telephone, internet, broadband coverage, uh, video capabilities, etc. But the problem is it's got a very limited footprint, if you will. Uh, rarely do you get more than two miles in any one direction in this part of the country because the line of sight technology, you need to be able to, the handset needs to be able to see the antennas, if you will. If a topographical feature such as a mountain will block the signals. Buildings will block the signals. Trees, leaves, things like that can cause degradation of the signal. Um, and so, you know, if we were propagating over water where there were no obstructions, it would probably go five miles. But because this is northern New England and the topo, the topography often goes like this and there's heavy tree cover, as you can see from that site there, which is the McClellan site, um, it doesn't reach, it, it doesn't reach into the gap, doesn't go that 2.6 miles, only goes about half that distance. All of these surrounding sites that there are towers on, as shown on that table too, AT&T is already on. If an existing tower could reach into this gap and provide coverage into that gap, they would do that, but they can't. And so there is no existing transmission tower within this gap that exists, and there is no transmission tower surrounding the gap that can reach into the gap. And that's the problem. So that's why we say for tier one, we don't we, we can't use tier one. We have to go down from that tier. The second tier is uh, new towers within the light industrial or industrial zone. And <coughs> We're aware, we were, we were aware of putting this application together, that the, the light industrial zone, there is a corner of the zone, so to speak, right sort of in front of where we are. And in fact, with the application, we submitted a copy of the zoning map. It's on tab A, but I think this gives a good picture. There's our approximate site, there's our site approximate location, and the LI zone is in front of us on Holmes Road. And <clears throat> we spent a lot of time when we were putting this application together on this issue, and the staff and, and the town's consultant rightfully pointed it out. 
here's why we didn't go on the LI zone, okay? Because that is really close to Holmes Road, and there's not much tree cover there. One of the purposes of your ordinance, in addition to making sure that you have good coverage and a good wireless uh, infrastructure, so to speak, if you read the purpose, the very second thing is to avoid undue visual impact. And I do a lot of these hearings over three states, and what everybody complains about these towers is they don't want to see them. That's clearly the biggest complaint. When we get people out objecting to sites, it's because we don't want to look at it. What we did here was we found a site just behind the LI zone that we think you will not see the tower at all from Holmes Road. We think you will see the tower very much if we put it into the light industrial zone. We balance the visual impact with the coverage available. The other reason why we're not proposing the LI zone is because at 130 feet, which is really the, the max your ordinance allows, although the, the board can grant 20 feet additional, but at the truly permitted height of 130, the LI zone site does not work for AT&T's coverage purposes. AT&T is very clear about that. At 130 on the, in the light industrial zone doesn't work for them. You move it back in the efficient game, it works. And so we were balancing those two competing needs, if you will, between the trade-off between coverage and visibility. And what really, I mean, they're, they're sort of equal, but what really carried the day for us is because of the visual impact, uh, we're very confident from the fish and game property, you're not going to see that at all from Holmes Road, whereas there's going to be a lot of visual impact if you go to uh, the light industrial zone at 130 feet. If the fish and game zone weren't, or excuse me, if the fish and game property weren't within the tower overlay district, that would be a real problem. But we are, fortunately. And so the ordinance says the fish and game property is good property to use as long as you can meet the four tier issue. And we think we can. Um, so we think the fish and game property is really ideal because it gives AT&T the coverage it needs. AT&T can use the light industrial from an RF perspective. And the topper is if we go back on the fish and game property, based on our studies, which we'll talk about in a minute, you're not going to be able to see this from Holmes Road. Whereas if you, we bring it forward to the LI zone, which is right on Holmes Road, it's going to be very, very visual. There's going to be a real visual impact. And so that's why we feel we meet the second tier uh, as to why um, we meet the second tier, or we can pass through the second tier, if you will. Um, the third tier is um, whether there are uh, existing telecommunications facilities, or we can put in a telecommunications facility on existing structure. Uh, this is very similar to the first tier, if you will. Um, we don't believe there are any existing structures in the gap that can host this facility. And again, this is a line of sight technology. You do need height. There's no question about it. Um, we took a very careful look at that area. We didn't find any existing structures uh, capable of hosting uh, AT&T's facility at the height that AT&T needs. Um, and therefore, um, we feel we meet um, that uh, criteria. Keep in mind, to be equivalent to what we're proposing from an RF perspective, uh, that existing structure would have to be 120, uh, 120 feet high because the board can, or the, or the ordinance allows the antennas to be uh, raised 10 feet above the structure. Um, so you would need something, uh, you would need a very tall structure there in that significant gap area, uh, and we did not find it. So that brings us to the fourth tier, which is a new transmission tower 
in the Tower Overlook District, um, and that's where we are. And that's what we're proposing. Um, what I'd like to do is walk you through the, those RF plots to show you why this site does work for AT&T so well. Um, the <clears throat> I'm going to start with the last RF plot in the packet. These go from lower to higher. I'd like to go from higher to lower. Um, the, if you go to that tab in the RF4, which is, I guess, tab B, well, the very last plot is the, the real bird's eye view of, of Scarborough in the area showing a lot of surrounding sites. But this is the RF plot, and that's at tab B. Uh, it's entitled Proposed 1900 LTE Coverage at 126 feet. The reason we use 126 feet is because it's really measured from the center line of the antenna. The top of the antenna would be, the top of the tower is at 130 feet, and that's just about where the top of the antenna is. These are panel antennas that are almost like, uh, I always uh, refer to like fluorescent lights, those long sort of square fluorescent lights, not unlike uh, panel antennas. Um, the center line of AT&T's tower, or antennas, would be at 126. This coverage shows, the, the blue cover, color shows the anticipated coverage from AT&T's antennas at that height. Uh, this is a perfect solution for this gap at 130 feet. Um, rarely do you get such a perfect uh, fill-in. Um, and by the way, these RF plots are generated using very sophisticated uh, software that takes into account uh, topography, distance, signal, strength, power, um, what they call clutter, which would be buildings, trees, etc. Um, and they constantly test this. Once they build a site, they go and they drive test this and actually look at the um, RF signals they get from the existing site, sort of compare it and fold that into the software itself. So the software is actually very, very accurate. Um, at 126 feet or 130 feet, it really fills that gap very, very well. And some of the um, comments from the uh, staff or from the consultant was, well, maybe you can go up to 150 feet. And our response to that is, well, okay, but this fills the gap so well, AT&T can live with 130 feet. Why do you want to increase it to 150 feet? I'll talk about the location in a minute, but for the RF, footprint uh, for ATT purposes, this, this works very well. Your ordinance requires us to run lower heights. So we did, we did it in increments of 10 feet. Uh, the next plot shows uh, 116 center line for at and the next plot back going towards the front of the book, I should say. That's entitled 116 zoom in. Um, there are some areas of, of Questionable coverage um, on Gorham Road up here where it starts meeting the green, you'll see the white area. Um, it starts receding back along the edges. Um, it's not as good. Uh, and if you go down to 106, you'll see those white areas start to increase. Where those white areas increase, there's weak coverage. That would mean that it's problematic whether you can initiate a call or whether you can hold a call as you travel through that area. And as you flip back to 96, oops, as you flip back to 96 and then 86, you'll see those white areas increasing not only along Gorham Road, but also Holmes Road. Um, and uh, the coverage is not quite as good, the fit is not quite as good, um, and therefore um, we think 130 is, is the optimal height. Um, the <clears throat> I'm going to jump ahead if I can to site plan, just very quickly. Uh, on sheet 103, 
three. There's a good side view of the, the monopole, and these are the antenna arrays. This is a design of a four carrier pole, and you'll see that it goes, it calls out the center line. Each antenna array has to have 10 feet of separation from center line to center line. So the RF waves don't interfere with each other, and the RF signals don't interfere with each other. And so uh, you need 126 center line here. The next one coming on would be at 116 center line, then 106, then 96. The uh, Mariner Tower has discussed has had discussions with uh, Verizon. Verizon is very interested in this site. We fully expect Verizon will co-locate on this site. Um, one of the issues that was spotted in the staff report is will this pole be sufficient to, kick, to, to cover or to address future carriers' needs? Um, do you want to go higher because we might be able to get more carriers on it? Uh, Verizon's already indicated that they can do with 116. 116 or 106? 116, I'm sorry. 116. Um, and so we have a second carrier who's already said to us, you know what, we don't even need a provider, which again is pretty unusual, trust me on that. Um, Verizon said we can live with 116. <coughs> what we can do with this, and I don't mean to make any presumptions, I don't know what's going to happen with this application, but if we do get approved at 130 on the fish and game site, we can build what's called an extendable tower um, so that we can engineer and build a foundation uh, and a pole so that if this tower gets full up, if it gets, because it's right now designed for four, but if, a fifth, if, if four carriers come on and co-locate and put their antennas here, a fifth carrier comes to you, and keep in mind, they're going to be subject to the same four-tier requirement we are, so they have to do what we do only now there's this tower there inside this gap. If they can show you that 86 feet doesn't work for them, we could extend the tower up by 10 feet so that presumably they would get center line of 136 feet. We could do that. And the obvious advantage to that is um, right now we're only doing 130 feet. And again, we're confident that that has very low visual impact. So you're not building a 150 foot tower right off the bat when maybe you don't need 150 feet, maybe you'll never need 150 feet. So that's the advantage to that. Um, the, um, so we think that would be a good solution, if you will, to this need. Um, we think that would be a good way to address the issue, and it's, it's right for your staff and, and your consultants to raise that issue because, uh, especially with towers, it's good to be proactive rather than reactive. But, uh, and we'd be happy to do that as a condition of approval. Again, I'm not making any assumptions, but uh, if we ever get that far, you can you can put it in condition of approval, saying that we will, uh, you know, do this as an extendable tower with the foundation uh, and the tower that would uh, support. Um, future expansion uh, if and when necessary. Um, <clears throat> Before you go any further, are you are you done in your mind with the sort of step one priority of location portion of the of the presentation? Because so we want to try and take this in no. steps. I know some of this is interrelated. All right. Well, and the reason sure. I say no is I, 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 want to, I want to talk about the balloon test, the visual study, because that definitely ties into, the, in my opinion, the four step process. Because I think that's key to understanding why we say we should get the new tower and not have to go to the light industrial zone. If I can do that, sure. and then we, sure. if you want to. Step At that point, we'll step back and yep. have discussion on location and then yep. move on. Thanks. Um, the, uh, if 
I may, I forgot to say this. We, um, we got the staff report. We, we were able to run um, an RF plot for Burnham Road, um, which is one of the, if I may, Mr. Chair, this is the one site on that table two that um, has an existing tower, but that AT&T is not on. And this is about uh, 2.3 miles from the um, proposed site. And the, I think we're trying to pull it up on the PowerPoint. Maybe up there in a second. But uh, the Burnham Road site is the one with the orange dot. And we ran it. It's up on the street. Um, we ran it at 119 feet. Um, it's our, we're not quite sure that height. That, that tower does have four antenna arrays on it. And so if you took a picture, if you looked at a picture of that site, this is pretty much what you'd see. It's got four antenna arrays. So we would be going in, in a, a fifth level, so to speak. And um, uh, the, so we're assuming that the 119 height is available. If it's not, and we were actually at 109 feet, the coverage would actually decrease. The problem with Burham Road is twofold. First, it doesn't reach the gap area we're trying to cover, number one, and that's due to the distance. The second problem is it brings in a lot of duplicate coverage uh, from some of the other sites, and particularly that uh, McClellan Road site um, that I pointed out before. So uh, Burnham Road uh, does, not, does not cover the gap. Um, can you say the green and say the green coverage already? That's, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, but didn't you yeah. just say they're not on this tower? No, they're not. Oh, they are. Okay. Um, Tree cover. 
and the topography. I, I misspoke. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Um, and the next page is the same predictive model, if you will, but zoomed in closer. And that sort of purple triangle, if you will, right in the middle um, is the um, proposed fishing game site. And so uh, the first picture that we have in the study uh, is um, near the speedway on Two Rod Road. It's a distance of half a mile away. Um, and by the way, if you if you go back one page, you'll see the letters are tied in. You can see where each photograph is taken. Photograph A, which is that near Speedway on Two Rod Road picture, is taken there. Um, photograph G is right above it. It's a, it's a key in with the letters. But at 130 feet, um, half a mile away, virtually no, no visibility whatsoever. The first picture shows the balloon, if you will. You can't really see it here because of the distance and because it's only 130 feet. The second picture has the balloon taken out and the monopole photoshopped in, if you will, but you can't really see either one of them from that location, and that's only half a mile away. Um, the second set of pictures, uh, photo location B, is about uh, eight tenths of a mile away from Gorham Road. Um, and again, at 130 feet, the first picture shows the balloon, if you will, but you can you can't really see it. The second picture um, has the monocle, uh, but again, you can you can't really see it at all. And that's eight tenths of a mile away. Uh, the third picture, the third set of pictures, um, is uh, six tenths of a mile away. It's near the golf course clubhouse, photo C, photo location C. Um, and this is the first one, first set, where uh, there's any visibility. Um, you can see the monopole in that second photograph, photoshopping. Um, the third, the next set of photographs, I should say, fourth set of photographs is location D near 170 Holmes Road. Um, this is 1.45 miles away. Again, the balloon barely visible, if at all. And uh, the monopole also barely visible, if at all. And as the staff correctly pointed out, these photographs are taken in what's called leap off conditions. Um, this is when you want your balloon test done, if you are sticklers for this type of thing. Um, because obviously, when these trees have leaves on it, it's going to be invisible from that location altogether. Um, photo location E. Uh, is from Beach Ridge Road. It's 1.3 miles away at 130 feet from the Fishing Game Club. Um, you can just barely see the, the, um, the balloon, barely see the top of the, the monopole from the Fishing Game Club. Um, the next set of photographs um, is from the on-ramp I-95. Again, uh, and that's uh, almost a mile away, nine tenths of a mile away, uh, barely visible. And then photo location G near the speedway on Holmes Road. Somewhere in that picture is a yellow balloon. I can't see it. Again, the monopole essentially is obscured by the um, the tree cover, and again, that's a, that's a new box condition. Compared to that, uh, 
Uh, we weren't able to do a balloon test from the light industrial zone because it's private property uh, and we can't float the balloons. But we were able to do the predictive study. This is not part of your application. I apologize for that. But if I may, Mr. Chair, I'll hand this out. This is the same uh, predictive study, if you will, as the first couple pages of our visual study for the Fish and Game Club. And this is, uh, we picked a spot in front, which is in the light industrial zone. Do we have this on he uses the word cyan. I've never, I never knew what cyan meant, so I started reading this. It's the light green area. Um, and this, what you need to focus on, in our opinion, um, is the really the second page of this. Because this, that is the second page. Um, the second page is sort of the zoom in of the of that um, uh, predictive study, and that shows probably well uh, close to half a mile, where 130 foot monopole is going to be highly visible on Holmes Road. And I went out to the site tonight. I don't pretend to know Scarborough as well as you. I don't pretend to know Holmes Road as well as you. But I went out and drove up and down Holmes Road. And I went into the, as far as I could on the fish and game property. They had the gate down, so I couldn't go all the way in. Um, there's no question a pole in that light industrial zone is going to be extremely visible from Holmes Road. When you talk about two miles away, if there's a promontory on the other part of town, you're looking back, you know, in, and I think the predictive study shows this. Quite honestly, there's not going to be a heck of a lot of this difference between the two sites. But when you get up on Holmes Road, it's going to be in your face in the light industrial zone. There's no question about it. There's very little tree cover there. Uh, it's so much closer to the road. So the reason, um, the, the two reasons we feel we should be able to get to the fourth tier as I said before, and Ernesto can talk to this point if you wish to talk to him about it in further detail, is at 130 feet, the light industrial zone doesn't work for AT&T. And it may only be three tenths of four tenths of a mile away from the fish and game site, but in this world, that's a, that can be a big difference because you're only propagating maybe two miles in any one direction due to the tree covering topography. And so by shifting it by four tenths, at 130 feet, it doesn't work for AT&T from an RF perspective. And, as I said, the visual impact, in our opinion, is just a lot greater from the light industrial zone. And so for those two reasons, uh, we feel we meet the four-tier test. If you now, Mr. Chair, I, I'd be happy to take a pause here if you have questions about that. I think that would be a good idea at this point. So, we'll give you another chance in a little bit. Uh, so again, we're we're focused right now on step one, which is priority of location and those four tiers. And I'll open it up to whoever wants to I'll start off. Public comment. It's supposed to be public comment. Yeah. We do have the opportunity for public comment, and we probably should do it on a step-by-step -step basis. So before we get into board discussion, if there's anyone in the public who'd like to get up and speak or ask any questions, feel free. All right, seeing none, we'll turn to the board. Put it up for grabs. Who wants to start? Mike? Thank you, Mr. Um, thank you for uh, your presentation thus far. I'm curious on the uh, on tab, I think it's tab B, page five, when you talk about existing towers. Yep. Uh, now, I know that a tower exists at Springbrook Park on Longmeadow. Now, whether that would 
meet your requirements or not is really not my question, but uh, why wouldn't a poll like that be listed? It's a uh, disguised as a well-endowed flagpole at the park. <laughs> well, I think uh, U.S. Cellular occupies it. So are those kinds of polls listed in this kind of analysis? or Well, they be? That, that kind of poll would not be an existing transmission tower. Uh, in my opinion, that would be, well, I, I'd have to look at the ordinance to be sure, but it, it's probably a facility. I, I could be wrong. Okay. Then how, how far away is it? Where is it located in the park? Yeah, it's located, uh, well, you know where your photo D, I think, was? Okay. Uh, you, can, you can see uh, Long Meadow Road probably from there. Okay. On your map. But regardless, I guess, I guess what I'm just looking for is uh, I would expect that that would be a part of anyone's analysis now. My guess is that that likely would not after I've heard your presentation, likely would not meet your qualifications. And I'm not even sure whether that kind of design uh, can incorporate another uh, another tenant, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, from from my point of view, I would imagine that most of us would believe that to be an existing facility. I guess I'm not familiar with that facility. Um, is, is it truly a flagpole? I mean, sometimes they disguise them and they actually fly flags from them. Yeah, they don't fly flags. Yeah. They do? Okay. No, the correction. They do not apply flags. They do not. No. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I understand mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, my, it's probably a greatly limited height. And oftentimes, in those type of poles, because it's such a constricted space, right. and Ernesto can correct me if I'm wrong, instead of like an antenna array like this, mm -hmm. where you have all your arrays across, they have to put some antennas here, then they have to put some antennas below them. Where is this place? And so there's even more limited space, and that pushes the height down even further. Um, so I, it's hard for me without knowing the exact height and location of that. Um, right. I would agree with you in general, as a general statement, <laughs> that an existing flagpole structure like that, whether it's a real flagpole or a fake one that they're just using, would be incorporated into the four-tier review. Whether that's a transmission tower for the first tier or an existing facility or existing structure for the third tier, I'd have to look at the ordinance. I don't know if you want me to do that right now. I would agree that that would be one of the ones that would have to be evaluated. Um, and my only other comment right now is, uh, when, you, when is there any, and forgive me, chime in Jay or anyone else, if, uh, is there anything in the ordinance that tells an applicant or advises the applicant where they must take their site analysis from? No, I, the Not ordinance sure. doesn't get that. Well, like where you decide. Uh, where they decide to take their photos. Yeah, where. Oh, 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 where oh, 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 Specificity. So if there's an area that the board feels isn't covered or that you want to see a photo from, I think that's... Well, I just think that um, a lot of pages, so I apologize. But it just appears to me that uh, in, a, in a couple of the um, renditions, it looks like Cloverleaf Lane would have been an um, ideal opportunity for you to take a... use as a... Uh, what of your points to make with what the visibility analysis might might see might yeah. show? I think there are, there are two ish two concepts here. One is where you want photographs taken. The other is where we actually took photographs from. Um, I have no problem where you actually took them from. I was just wondering uh, what what um, reasoning you used to determine what those locations ended up being. And I throw out there that I see Cloverleaf Lane. It looks to me like you know. Halfway down that road, I mean, you'd be looking potentially right at that pole if, in fact, it showed that. But I don't know what the topography is like. I, it would have it would have been beneficial for me to see that as a, one of your selected locations. Generally speaking, they will take a photograph from the areas it's visible from uh, within um, you know the mile and a half to two mile radius. 
uh, if and I see one or two spots here they did not, and I, I don't know why they didn't do that. Uh, is, is Cloverleaf Lane in red on the predictive map? Uh, can you direct me to a good map so I can I can tell you where it is? Well, what page? Uh, this is what I'm looking at. Uh, tab. Uh, well, same tab. Tab F. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. That's okay. And then flip down to uh, next page. We need to so this 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 is close. Okay. Um, Does everyone see where I'm looking? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, right. what, what's the what's the tab F? Yes, area right here. Okay. This this one right here is, is the second page in after the cover. No. Yep. Sure there you go. Okay. Well, either one, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> if I mean, I wasn't there during the balloon flow. Um, my guess is if Cloverleaf Lane is not in red, it wasn't visible from um, from that stretch of, of the road. Okay. So you generally look at the red first, and then you select locations within yeah. that area? Yeah. I see. Okay. Just, just to interrupt you for one second. Um, they're taking pictures from all over. They're only including photos in the report where it's visible. They're not just going and saying, let's go to point A, point B, point C, point D, and put a report together and see if it's visible or not. They're only showing photos in the report where they found it was visible. So there, there, there could have been many other photos taken, but it wasn't visible, so they don't make it into the report. Correct. Okay. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for an explanation as to what determines the locations that you take the photos. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John? All right, a couple things. Obviously, you're going to need to come back to us with some corrections in the plan, but also some corrections in your analysis that you've missed the tower. The flagpole? Yes. We can run the flagpole. And is that the only one? Is that the only one you missed? I don't believe. Well, we need that verification before I'm going to make any vote. Okay. I don't have an issue with the location. It's probably a great location, uh, but it's a very sensitive issue for sure. any, any community, and we as a zoning uh, change uh, had a lot of work on that. Sure. Uh, I want some peer ver verification on this coverage. We've got all your data, which is just simply said. Take it from what it is, your data. Mm -hmm. We want some peer review on that coverage to see if indeed that's what you need. The whole purpose of this tower thing wasn't just what AT&T needs, it's what this community needs. Understood. All right. Uh, as far as the rest of the site plan, I have no issue with that at this point. There's some technical issues as far as the driveway width and whatever. But everything else I'm fine with. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, John. Rob? I'm okay for the moment. Okay. <coughs> Susan? I'd like to just take a quick look at the um, Willard and Curran letter. The priority of locations, page two. I don't want to wait until the chair is part of the conversation. Okay, I'm, on, I'm, I'm looking Sorry. at the priority of locations on the list yes. and current. Um, I don't want to take the time to go down through all of these, but I'm, I'm going to ask staff, because staff specifically asked us to look at this. Um, I can't really, I don't feel as if I'm really qualified to say, for example, there is only one existing building structure that has been identified for potential use. The questions, do we feel as if the questions that were asked by Woodward and Curran on this thing have been answered? Or do we want to take the time now to go through them? Well, I think, I'll just, I think what Mr. DuPont just reflected, the applicant provide additional materials with regards to under uh, one priority locations A about the tower on 4 Burnham Road, paragraph up above. We were provided evidence, but much like stormwater or traffic, we have that type of submittal 
which is appropriate to respond, but it's the appropriate response is, you know, to provide that for our peer reviewer to look at it. Because <coughs> I'm certainly not qualified to take a look at that propagation report and, and weigh in on it. So um, I think in terms of that, that's certainly useful. Um, I think the one you just re reflected on, there's one existing structure that has been identified. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think, you know, staff, we didn't do a, we sort of teased our brains to think, you know, what else was out there? Frankly, the flagpole at Spring Crook Park didn't pop to our minds. Um, so could there be others? Sure. But I think, you know, Mr. Wood identified another area that should be looked at. Um, you know, it may well be that Mr. Springer's assessment of that flagpole is correct because it is pretty limited in what can be done in there, but that's the purpose of the ordinance. So. Um, again, um, as you know, I think you know if the once the board feels comfortable that you know A has been you know have all the evidence for A, we can check that priority list off, and then we can go to the next one. Um, so at this point, it sounds like there might be a little bit more homework to do. Maybe well, we'll get there. I think that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. I mean, when we when we get these peer reviews back, sure. they don't just come to us peer review goes yes. to the applicant yep. as well. I'm, I'm accustomed to receiving a response from the applicant to the notes created by the peer reviewer. So that's what I'm just saying. I mean, these sound like good questions to me because we're looking at the priority of locations now. And I don't have, I mean, I could ask you to go through them and you can give me the verbal answer to this, but we don't have anything from the applicant and quite frankly, Anything, anything after 9 o'clock, I'm barely here. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been discovered it's discussed that I just missed it. No, no, but I think your point, is, you know, is, is certainly salient that, you know, when, when the applicant, you know, should the board not get to a decision tonight and it's sounding like at least from the two or three folks we've heard so far that maybe some additional evidence is going to be warranted that, you know, a future submission would, would include supplemental paperwork to this with a response to staff and peer review comments. With I think that that's really addressing. Yeah. Not and to so interrupt, but I would like to just say in general, this is a very complicated issue. It's the first time we've done this. We worked hard at our ordinance, but let's face it, we don't know if it's really going to work or not. So we really have to be super careful right here, right now. And I would really feel better if we had number one, which is what we're looking at tonight, mm -hmm with the peer review questions and your response to the peer review questions, just so that we can say that I've seen the T's and I've seen the dotted I's and I'm going to feel better about that because it's way outside the realm of my, that's why we pay Woodward and Current. And now we'd like to have you not just tell me the answer, but give it to me in writing. We'll be happy to do that. That'd we just, we only got this. I think on Thursday or Friday. I know, I know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not yeah, talking about this. I'm just saying this is right. why I'm doing this. Absolutely. I want to be able to go back and have a really good If I could, Mr. Chair, if you wouldn't mind. One of the things that I've heard tonight that I think, you know, is one of the elements that the planning board, you know, if we're going to try to provide some guidance tonight, one of the things we could try to provide guidance on is what I've heard the applicant talk a lot about tonight is, you know, part of the, um, excuse me while I, Get to my notes here. Where am I? On, um, for example, on number two, why not um, uh, put the facility in the light industrial district? Has to do with sort of the idea of buffering and screening. And so I think that's what this board needs to weigh is, you know, when the applicant comes back, maybe they can provide a little more materials as to what type of propagation we would get from that location understanding that as the applicants demonstrated that the screening wouldn't be the same, you know, wouldn't maybe not as dense or as, as um, well hidden um, as the proposed location. And that's where the board really needs to, you know, what's the judgment call there? Would a higher, would a tower in that location, maybe it covers more area, but it's up to the board to sort of determine what's the goal of the, you know, what are we looking at here? What's the more, and I'm very higher intense. Um, I think you're saying that you agree with me that I would like to have a little bit more meat yeah. on the bones. Yeah, yeah. So let's leave it at that. It is after nine. I'm sorry. It's simple. Yep. That'll okay. take care of my big okay. issue. Yep. Thanks. Roger? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't basically have any problem with your presentation and what you've said so far. Uh, I do have a question regarding protocol, though. Uh, with the towers, 
and other, you know, co-location and things like that. Um, when you, when, when AT&T or Verizon or anybody proposes a tower, <coughs> um, do they, is it almost like a requirement that you have to let other carriers go on to it? And in other words, you could, you could reduce the market basically if you had a low enough tower, I assume. So nobody else could really take advantage of it. You, you could, but your ordinance, in my opinion, wouldn't allow somebody to do that. Okay. Um, and I, I want to make be clear on the, on the players involved here because the applicant is actually Mariner Tower. Mm. It's basically a vertical real estate company, if you will. The carriers are AT&T and Verizon. And so Mariner Tower um, is in business to lease space to the carriers. Okay. Mariner Tower has a vested interest in allowing future co-location, absolutely. Um, AT&T is a tenant, Verizon is a tenant. So part of your protection, well first of all, the, 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 your biggest protection is your ordinance. And staff and, and Woodard has already pointed this out because you, I, I think this board can require an applicant to make sure that there's sufficient co-location. There's no question about that. Um, and they've already started to do that to a certain degree with these reports. Uh, I have no doubt that if we had come in with a one carrier poll at whatever height, they would have said, wait a minute, mm -hmm. where's the other co-location spot? But in addition to that, Mariner has every, it has every uh, intent of uh, allowing co-location in the future because that's, that's what they do. Okay. And they have established relationships with uh, all of these carriers. Okay. I'm also set. Your turn, Nick. That just opened up a whole new line of thought for me. Um, so, as, as it relates to our ordinance, I don't even know if I want to jump into this stuff right now. Um, okay, so here's the problem I'm struggling with. This is the application, I and mean, this is right out of under number one, like the last sentence. Um, the application shall the application shall demonstrate that a location of higher priority cannot reasonably fulfill the applicant's requirements for coverage improvements in the intended geographic area. We're taking whatever they tell us they need as a basis to determine whether or not the cell tower height is the correct height. In fact, our applicant right now isn't even an operate telecommunications. They operate antennas. So the applicant is telling me that they need a 126-foot tall tower when, in fact, they could go with a 6-foot tower because they don't do telecommunications. They sell property on telecommunications towers. My point is, I'm looking at this map, and I don't see the real big difference in 116 feet high or 126 feet high. I've got no numbers here that tell me 30,000 residents receive coverage at 126 and only 25,000 receive it at 116. I've got, I mean, I see that there's a coverage area. I don't, there's no number in, that I see here other than some blue dots and white dots. And 116 and 126 look very similar to me at this point in time, okay? So I say, okay, do you need 126? The only explanation that made sense for you needing 126 over 116 at this point was that you can add other carriers in the future. And that's, but then you kind of explained that away and said we can do extendable towers. So couldn't we get away with 116 today and then when your next carrier came over, you could come back and say we need to put 10 feet on it because we've got another carrier coming in. That, that's one of the problems I'm seeing with what I'm trying to deal with right now is the applicant is determining how much cell tower they need. <laughs> and they're, they're telling us how, how much it is. And I've, I've got no way to verify how much you really need. I, how, I have no idea. I mean, the coverage map is helpful. I'll say that. But I struggle with it because it, and it's not anything to do with you. It's the way that we have worded this last portion of the sentence. All right. The other problem I'm, I'm having with the issue in general is the, the way that this is written as well states that you should be in a light industrial district as a, a tiered priority. 
So did you, did you reasonably demonstrate that you couldn't actually get what you wanted out of the light industrial area? And this goes back to my first point. You're here telling me what you need. So you can, you basically can tell me that it doesn't work. And I have to believe him. Because he, tell, he sets his standard. And then he's just going to prove that he can't meet it. So he can come in here and say 116 doesn't work because he doesn't want to work in, in, in light industrial. Is anyone following my train? Am I rambling like a crazy man at 10 p.m.? I have a disagreement with you on part of okay. what you're saying. Okay, well, so, so it's making sense to some extent people are following what I'm trying to say. No. Well, barely. It's past my bedtime. <laughs> right, right. I mean, tell me, tell me where I'm wrong. Well, first of all, I thought he made a great case for not having it in the light industrial. I think he made a great case for not doing it there. It's not it's visibility, the visuals, right? Visibility and, and, and you know, so forth. I agree with you with, with the statement we don't know at that height, 116 or 126, uh, how many homes or how many entities, I'll call it, instead of just homes, uh, would be, you know, uh, the difference between the two. I mean, would, would there be a big difference in, in, in the height as far as coverage is concerned as to the amount of entities that would be covered? Um, we both agree on the fact that they said that, you know, they can go up, you know, depending upon the need of carriers. Um, so, but I just, yeah, I think the presentation as far as not being in the light industrial was pretty clear to me not to be there. Actually, I think the site you've chosen is almost perfect for what we're talking about. The problem I have with it is the language. He has to prove that it doesn't, it cannot reasonably accommodate the facility. The light industrial area actually can physically accommodate the facility. Oh, that I agree with you. So, <laughs> I, but I, I don't see the leeway in here, the way the ordinance is written, for us to say it's uglier in light industrial, therefore it's okay for us to bypass that priority. Well, that's a good, good point you're making. That's, that's, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Is the where's the that. flexibility when the way that's written? And it's not there. That, I guess, was the point I was sort of making earlier when, when Ms. Oglis asked her question, mm -hmm. that ultimately, you're right, as, as you go through this, you know, if, if the board were to cross off existing transmission towers for, you know, if we get to that point, the next one is why can't the applicant needs to demonstrate, and it, it's, it's this paragraph after D that I think starts to get after, you know, your concern as to, oh, the applicant can tell us whatever he wants. Well, no, D tells us what the applicant needs to provide in terms of evidence to get there. So, you know, they would need to demonstrate with these, you know, it's, um, you know, there's a host of sort of statements in here, and I'm not going to, won't bore the world here to read them right now, but um, that demonstrates why that light industrial doesn't work. The rationale that they've provided so far that I've heard is really about the screening and buffering. That's really a step two question, not a step one question. Right. And so ultimately, that's where I would suggest to Ms. Oglis, you know, the board will act as the board chooses to act. But as you go through the priority ranking, step one doesn't talk about buffering, doesn't talk about those things. Those are step two questions. Right. And so um, that's what I, that, so thank you for sort of but the coming full circle. The hurdle what I was step getting one at. is physically, reasonably, they can accommodate in less light industrials in this town. But we don't have the flexibility to say it's ugly there until later. I have you heard on that? I, I respectfully disagree, and here's why. Because if you look at the purpose, it says the purpose is these standards, all the standards, not just the ones on site review, not just the ones on buffering. It says these standards are to allow for the appropriate siting of transmission towers, et cetera, et cetera, while minimizing adverse visual effects of the trans transmission towers. Now, it doesn't say. Well, these standards, except for the four tiers, serve these purposes. All these standards serve these purposes. And I would suggest to you, I, I know how much work you put into these because I see these all over, the top, all, all over the place. But I would respectfully suggest to you that if you can go back in time when you were adopting these and somebody had posed the question to you that are you going to 
denies the tower in the tower overlay district, even if it's better in almost every way, just so that you can meet the requirement of the third tier, I would suggest to you everybody would say no. That's not the purpose. The purpose of all of these standards is to meet the appropriate siting, which includes minimizing adverse visual impacts. And I, I, I don't know what else I can say about that. I mean, it's just uh, the, I think a reasonable accommodation doesn't just mean structural issues. I think a reasonable accommodation, in my opinion, would include this type of visual impact. I, I, I sat in some of those meetings, preliminary meetings, and I can tell you that the public outcry was we didn't want these eyesores in right. the scene. I, I can, I can, I know what wording is, but sometimes we get bogged down with wording. Sometimes that's why I never so, wanted to become a lawyer. I, no, I, but, I agree. Uh, no, I, I get it. Better side. I get it. But that's not the point. I don't I'm just wondering, are we going to, you know? Nick, I think the simple question, Nick, is let's right. ask the attorney. We have a town attorney. All right. I think we need to. Right. I think we need to. I need, think we need to shut this down at this point. There have been some, a lot of there have been a lot of great points made. There's plenty of homework to do. Um, it's the first time we've gone through this. It's uncharted territory on both sides, frankly. Um, I think you know to Susan's point earlier, that we're we're accustomed to a certain protocol where the applicant acknowledges and responds to peer review comments. I understand that they got to you not too long before this meeting. Um, and then on our side, this is all kind of new territory for us, and so I think there, I think there needs to be some some discussion at the staff level and mm -hmm. and and with with uh, legal discussions and certainly some additional um, information provided by the applicant in terms of um, additional detail and responding point by point to these. Peer review comments, and I, and I know you. I know you will be, um, and I won't belabor them by reading over them. They're all there. Um, and again, as as Jay said, the board will act as the board will act, and we we frequently have to grapple with difficult wording on things. But um, I would just suggest at this point that we we take a step back and and. Uh, Take this up at a future time, rather than kind of having an open-ended <laughs> discussion at 10:30 at night. Susan, I would just like to yeah. say that I, I, I want, in spite of what we're saying right now, I think this has been a very good presentation. This is a learning curve. Sure. Um, it's been a good one to start with. I don't feel defensive about it in any way. Sure. I don't feel inadequate in any way. I just feel as if that that needs to be a little more. It needs to be a little smoother. You know, it needs to be a little, and I think the staff and, and the assets can work that out. And right. Basically, I'm feeling pretty good about it. It is not to have delusions of grandeur or anything, but I think, you know, this is the first one out of the gate, and I think we all want to try to get it right and set the right type of tone and precedent. And so I think it makes sense for everyone to kind of take this in a measured way. So, and I really do appreciate the presentation. and. And um, I don't think anyone's casting aspersions on that. And, oh, no, not at um, all. It's a good first step. So, Do we need to act, Mr. Chairman? On Are we going to get continued to a date, time, and service? I'd like to make a motion, <laughs> Mr. Chair. You know, this did start, yeah, no, this this did start to feel like a trial after a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'd like to make yes, a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, table Navigator Properties LLC request for safe plan review for transmission power. At 79 Holmes Road to uh, future dates. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Uh, no, no, no. I can coordinate with you on what, how the board generally. Okay. All right. It, uh, this, is, right. this is typical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very typical. So uh, I'm happy to coordinate with you on uh, next second steps so we can get you go, keep you going before the board. Thank you. And by the way, there were three lawyers in my family. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We do have a second in motion still on the table, I believe. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank okay. you. And that's table. We have the capability of outside verification and that kind of thing. Yep. 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 Yep.
our peer reviews. Yeah. 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 Yep. That's what it's like ink to me. All right. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a town planner's report? Sure, just real briefly, you would have, should have before you a postcard for the Higgins Beach zoning repair workshop that's going to be taking place this weekend, starting Friday through Sunday. There's a series of different events. We did want to draw planning board's attention to Friday at noon. Lunch will be served. Let me start with that. <laughs> that's the one that we're inviting uh, uh, specifically uh, for committee members too, um, but folks from the community and boards and committees are welcome to come to any of the events that works best for your schedule um, to let us know your thoughts on taking the speech zoning repair. Thank you, Jay. I plan to be there. I'm sure that will really sway a lot of people. <laughs> uh, but I am looking forward to it in all seriousness. A lot of work has gone into that. Uh, is there an administra administrative amendment report? Do you not have anything to report this time? Thank you. Any planning board correspondence? You should have received a letter from the Nunsuch River Land Trust regarding the Mitchell Hill Road subdivision, um, uh, expressing general support That's in our record. So you have that. Thank you. Yep. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. No, did I restate? Did I mistake who it's for? I did. It sorry. was. It was in the garden. I'm sorry. Yeah. Misstated my. I'm doing. So it was for Mariner Tower. They had no objection. No objection to Navigator Properties application. Right. Thanks, Scott. Any planning board comments? No. Well, comment it out. <laughs> <laughs> Being as our right. last meeting was much shorter. Somebody else is running the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did, you, no comment. <laughs> no comment. With <laughs> 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 that, I will move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. We do have plans to sign. There are two. For